and gentlemen, good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks for the lifeline. I've had a slow morning. I'm going to apologize to you. It's 9.15, and we start normally at 8.30. We moved it back today to 8 to 9. I'm already a little bit late. It's my fault, and I apologize, because I hate to be late. But I walked in, and I just wanted to get a look and see what's going on in the courtroom before we started. I want to welcome you to the District Court of Maryland County. My name is Shane Spencer. I get the chance to work in this courtroom, this courthouse, with most of the entire team up here on a regular daily basis. We've asked you to come today to sit with us, because we want to share a few things with you. And by share, I, want to mean, I mean we want to expose you to some things you may not see every day. I don't think that you get to see an actual criminal plea every single day. I don't know that you get the opportunity to engage uh, a chief judge of a district court of the entire state on a daily basis. I don't believe in your school classrooms you get to see the superintendent come to your classroom every day. I don't believe you get to see a shock trauma nurse, a nurse from an ER, that sees some of the most tragic events in our state and one of the most elite hospitals in our state every day. I don't believe that in your courtrooms, your classrooms, you get to see a trooper and his partner come to you and put on a presentation to you every day. I don't believe you get to speak to some of the most experienced lawyers, trial lawyers, defense lawyers, prosecutors every day. I also don't believe you get to see the inner workings of the courthouse every day. Courthouse doesn't consist of just lawyers and judges, people that make this place run, people that make this place work, the brains of the operation, the backbone, people who allow us to get our jobs done. My little job is way down here in the totem pole. I don't believe you get to experience the administrator of the courthouse every single day or the court staff every single day. Those people sit right back here. They're not in the front where the judge gets to sit up top. They're the ones that make this building run. That's important to you because, in my opinion, the court whole is important for you to understand. I also don't think you get to have fun with me every single day. I'm a fun guy. <laughs> I like to have fun. We're going to have some fun today. We're going to talk to you about a lot of things, court stuff, life stuff. I brought an entire team to help, and I'm just one member of that team, but the team here is we're younger. Older. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> We're handsome and less handsome. <laughs> but we're all here. I tell you that because we have beautiful people and less beautiful people. I understand I'm not pretty and handsome like her. I understand that. I know my limits. I tell you this because we all have different life experiences. I was in high school closer in time than to you than old guy here was. That's a fact. I tell you that because I know you're all in high school. We are not the fun police today. We want you to share some things that we see every day, all day, in our lives as judges or lawyers or officers, educators, administrators, clerks. We want to tell you about things that we see that help, help make you think before you do things, make good choices. That's what we're talking about today, good choices. I hope when you leave today, you think about making a good choice. And if one of you makes one good choice, our job is complete. Just yesterday, my boss made me go to education class. See, I still take classes on a regular basis. My boss made me take that class. I was there. I learned, see, I took notes. I want you to make sure that today, before midnight today, 178 people will die from a heroin overdose in this country. Today. 178 today. It's 9, 15, 9, 17. Some of us will go to bed before midnight. Some of us won't. But at midnight today, 178 will be dead from heroin. I learned that. I tell you that because I think it's coming and coming and coming and coming. Not to you, though, because you're going to make good choices. Now I know my boss is here. My other boss is to my left, your right, superintendent of the schools, Dr. Arlotta. Chief Judge Morrissey, Dr. Arlotto, allow this team assembled to this program. By allow, I mean it's not just the schools, not just the courts, it's all of us. My full-time job is not here. I have a full-time job. My part-time job is doing this. I should be down the hall hearing cases, but I'm not, because the boss let me do that. In my next life, I want to be an educator, like Mr. Hood. I've known that man for several years now. I'm inspired. I want to teach. 
Dr. Lyle said, when I retire, maybe I can come back on and be a teacher. So I'm combining my assets and my skills and my friends and allowing me to do this. And by me, I mean the team we've assembled. But it's not just because I want to, because they believe in the program. They believe in it so much that we've grown the program. Broadneck, you're here, right? I haven't seen where y'all at. I don't think I've, I haven't seen y'all once now. This is the second time I've seen y'all, so I'm happy you're here. Old Mill, you're here. You're here every time. I appreciate that. Harbor, where are you at? I know y'all are here, and I knew you were coming, and I got my Harbor mug out today. I'm proud of my Harbor mug, right? I like gifts. I like gifts. Broadneck. I have no Broadneck gear, no Broadneck apparel. Swag. I like swag. I tell you all that because the schools allow us to do this here in the courthouse. Dr. Lau allows that to happen. Chief Judge shuts the courthouse down so we can do this. So before we go any further, I want to thank them publicly for allowing us to do this. Chief Judge Morrissey, Dr. Arlado, I want to give them the chance to welcome you on behalf of the Judiciary and the Board of Education. Chief, thank I appreciate you. it, sir. Thank you very much. Let me get out of your way. All right, good morning, everybody. My name's John Morrissey. I'm the Chief Judge of the District Court. Okay, let's handsome. The District Court is a statewide court system. So we range all the way from Garrett County out west. Anybody ever been to Garrett County? Go out skiing out that way? all the way to Ocean City, Maryland, where we have two courthouses, one in Snow Hill down south Ocean City, and then one you've probably seen on about 66, 67th Street, right as you come over the bridge. Hopefully you've never been in that courthouse. Anybody been in that courthouse? Don't raise your hand, you shouldn't. Because we're a statewide system, that means even though I'm from Prince George's County, I could be asked to sit in any other jurisdiction in the state because we have that type of jurisdiction as judges. What Judge Spencer forgot by calling me old is that I have the ability to ask him to go sit in Oakland and Garrett County tomorrow. <laughs> I was out here, <laughs> it's already signed. The district court was created in 1971 by a constitutional amendment to replace a series, kind of a hodgepodge of courts throughout the state. Annapolis City had its own court, Bowie had its own court, and places like that. And quite frankly, they weren't running very efficiently. The judges in some of those courts didn't even have to be attorneys. They were, there was nepotism going on, and quite frankly, some corruption was in the system. So they decided, the voters, they set it to referendum where the voters decided that they wanted this. And my predecessor, the first chief judge, Chief Judge Sweeney, who this building's named for, had six months to create a court system from scratch and find locations in each of the 23 counties plus Baltimore City in order to house the court and to employ the, at the time, about uh, 1,300 employees of the district court that would staff and work it and then to bring on the 82 judges that he needed to start up this system. And it was pretty interesting. There's, I have some old photographs in, in my library of where some of the first courthouses were. And in one particular instance, the courthouse was right in the same building as an auto mechanic uh, you know, uh, shop. So you could literally go in and pay your traffic ticket and get your oil changed at the same time. It was kind of a good concept that I'd like to bring back, but we've come a long way since then. Um, my job as a chief judge is kind of to be an a, a administrator, quite frankly. I don't sit very often anymore. I've been doing this as a chief judge for about four years. I was a presiding judge. I'm from Prince George's County, grew up there. And so I was a judge, presiding judge like Judge Spencer for eight years out in Prince George's County. Um, so I try to make sure that, that Judge Spencer in this courthouse has the proper equipment and staffing to make sure that they can do their job every day. We have 118 judges in the district court and we have almost 2,000 employees and a budget approaching $200 million a year. Um, I'm going to change gears right now though, if you can show the slide. So I was approached about two months ago by the Make-A-Wish Foundation and they had a particular um, young individual, young man that was requesting a wish come true from us which I thought was extremely unusual because I don't know too many people that want to be a judge when they're 16 years old, right? Well, meet Judge Victor Haley. Um, he wanted to be a judge and for his make a wish he asked the court if he could be a judge for the day. Uh, judge Victor already had his own robe and gavel and apparently he's been sick for an extended period of time and he would regularly call his nurses and doctors bailiffs and he would sentence individuals that he wasn't happy with to jail. Um, 
We were fortunate enough with the cooperation of my judges in Baltimore City to make um, Judge Victor's dream come true. Uh, unfortunately, about a week ago, Judge Victor passed away. Um, it was one of, and I consider this very close to that, it was one of the best days I've had as a judge in court. And that's because usually bad things happen in court, right? There's not many times that you look forward to coming to court. This may be one of them. Um, the other ones are getting married, adopting children, becoming a naturalized citizen, coming to drug court graduations. If you've ever want to see a moving, bring, bring handkerchiefs with you and tissues because if you've ever been to a drug court graduation, it's very hard not to cry because you'll see people reborn basically um, after all the struggles that they've had. The, our drug court programs are the future uh, of this court system to try to make sure that we are dealing with this opioid epidemic. Um, Judge Victor didn't have the chance to make very many decisions because of his illness, but you all will. And the, the key is to don't let the small things add up to become a big thing. And I'm going to give you an example. So you're going to be, who's driving? Is anybody here driving? Has anybody gotten a ticket yet? Okay, don't raise your hand because you don't want me to know that, okay? <laughs> you're incriminating yourself, right? You have a Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. So you're going to get a ticket. Pretty much everybody gets a ticket at some point in their life, right? Maybe you ran through a, a, a stop sign because you didn't see it. I did it on my last day of high school. I went to DeMatha High School. I was, it was the last day of high school. We were graduating that Saturday, and I ran through a stop sign. I just forgot that it was there and ran through it, got pulled over. Unfortunately, it was the same route that everyone takes to go to DeMatha, so I got heckled by every one of my classmates on the way in. Um, you want to make sure you handle that ticket. If you don't believe you are guilty, you want to fill out the ticket and request a trial date so you can contest that in court, right? Because not every police officer is correct every single time. They may be a lot of the time, but sometimes they're not. Or sometimes maybe the ticket wasn't written correctly. Or there may be other defenses that you have. Or you want to pay the ticket because you're guilty and you know that you did it and you don't want to take the time to come to court and so you pay that ticket. But you need to do something with the ticket because if you don't do anything with that ticket, then it sits out there and it eventually becomes a flag on your registration and your license. So let's say you don't do anything about that ticket and three months, four months goes by. Well, we know you didn't do anything about that ticket and we notify the MVA and then the MVA does what they do, spend your license and your in your registration for your car. And then you're leaving out of your school this afternoon and you drive out and a police officer hits the sirens and pulls you over. And he says, let me see your license and registration. You hand him your license. It hits that your license is now suspended. So you've gone from driving through a stop sign, which I believe is a $113 fine, to driving on a suspended license, which is a one year in jail or a $1,000 fine, right? Now the, uh, the officer has a choice as to whether to arrest you or to write you a citation and let you go. But let's suppose you're not dealing with that officer nicely because officers are human beings, right? And they're going to react to the way that you react to them. Politeness goes a long way. Have you heard 10 and 2, those kind of things? My dad taught me that, and I think he was right, and I've taught my children the same thing. 10 and 2, get your license and your registration and your insurance available for the police officer. Don't give the police officer a reason to get nervous because he has a gun, and hopefully you don't have a gun, right? So you want to keep your hands where he can see them so he doesn't get nervous. Last thing I want is a police officer coming up to give me something and I'm going to break bad with the officer. He's got a ticket book. He can just keep writing tickets, right? I'm not saying that they do that, but human nature would, would suggest that if you treat someone with respect, they're going to treat you back with respect, right? And I think that's an important lesson, not just in the police conversation, but with everybody. If you're at the supermarket and you're checking out, I always say hi to I start a conversation with the lady or the man that's checking me out, right? Because it's a nice thing to do and I enjoy the interaction. So you didn't pay your ticket. Now the officer, and you have been polite to the officer, the officer decides he's going to arrest you. And so he places you in cuffs, puts you in the back of his car, and they're going to bring you downstairs to our commissioners. Our commissioners are there 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Even in snowstorms where a court may close, the commissioners are there. And their job is to, when you come in, either 
decide that you're going to stay in jail until your trial date, right? They place you in a no-bond situation and you can't get out. No matter what anybody wants, you can't get out. You're in jail for 45 or 60 days. Or they decide to release you and they may release you on recognizance or on a bond, right? So let's say you, the officer just decides to give you a citation. He doesn't arrest you, he doesn't bring you downstairs, and you get a notice from the court, because that's what uh, uh, driving on a suspended is called a must appear. It means you have to show up for court. You can't prepay, you can't just pay $1,000, you have to come to court. So let's say you stick that, you don't want your parents to know that this all happened, you intercept the mail that comes that says the notice of the trial date, you stick it in your dresser and hide it from your mom and dad, and then you forget about it. You don't put it on a calendar because you guys probably don't maintain calendars, right? Have it on their phone, Judge. You could have it on your phone, right? I keep everything on my phone. You should see my calendar. Everything I do is either on this, this tablet or, or my phone. Um, and you forget about the court date. Well, what do you guys think happens after that? Yep, you're absolutely right. So I'm going to call out. I'm going to say State versus John Smith. Is Mr. Smith here? Mr. Smith has failed to appear. The time is now 927 bench warrant to issue, I'm going to set the bond at $1,500, or I'm going to allow the commissioner to set the bond. Well, now you've missed court three times, right? And you're going to have to come back in. Now the commissioner, if, if you had gotten arrested, the commissioner probably would have released you on your recognizance on the first driving, when, when you first got arrested for driving while suspended. Now you've missed court again, right? And he knows that you, you didn't take care of that underlying ticket, and he's worried now or the judge or the commissioner is worried now that you're not going to show back up for court because you've already demonstrated that you're not trustworthy enough to come to court when you're supposed to. And so that is when a commissioner then may set a bond. And I don't know about you guys, but I don't have $1,500 to post to get myself out of jail. I work for the government, just like most of us do here, and we don't make a whole lot of money. So who's going to pay that? Now your parents are going to have to get involved, right? Oh, and did I mention you're going to have to have an attorney when you come to court because your liberty's at stake and you could potentially go to jail for a year, right? So I'm assuming you'd want to have an attorney, wouldn't you? I mean, if you break your arm, you don't try to set your own arm. You go to a doctor, right, and, and get it set. Um, so you're going to want to have an attorney. Any idea how much an attorney is going to charge for driving while suspended? 1500 bucks probably. I haven't practiced in 13 years, but that's about what the going rate. Anybody else help me with that? You guys don't really practice. It's, it's anywhere How much is the charge? 750 to 1500 dollars somewhere in that range. So, you know, now you're out 1500 dollars, you maybe had to pay a bail bondsman, you're out whatever that percentage is that they charge you and you're out another 2000 dollars. And let's say you're you go to court and you really don't have much of a defense because your license was suspended. And what you should have done if you had hired an attorney is your attorney would say, we got to pay this underlying ticket and we got to get you unsuspended. So when we go to the judge, we can say we took action on this. We didn't let little mistakes pile up. We decided that we were going to get this taken care of before the judge even made us do it. That's what attorneys are good to do because they can give you advice like that. And that means a lot of difference. But now you're going to have something on your record, right? And even though it's only traffic, you think, you know, it's only traffic. Well, I can tell you, when commissioners apply to become a commissioner, I review every commissioner because they're judicial officers, so I'm actually appointing them to the position. And you know what I check? Driving records. I check to see whether or not they're driving records, because quite frankly, I don't want someone being a judicial officer that has multiple traffic violations, let alone criminal. They're not going to get hired if they have a criminal violation. They're, I'm not going to take that chance. Why would I hire someone that's, that's shown in the past that they committed some type of crime and I'm going to place them in a position where they're making decisions about others and placing them in jail or not, I'm not even going to take the chance. Even with traffic, if you get too many traffic tickets, why would I want to take the chance, right? So I'm going to stop lecturing on this, but my point is you can see that little things can add up to be big things. You need to, and I think you'll hear Judge Spencer say this, you need to own it sometimes. Not every time, but you need to own it. And you need to communicate, too. I, I've told my children, as my parents told me, that if they get in an uncomfortable position, I have a 17-year-old and a 14-year-old. My 17-year-old came to the class the last time because his school came here. I embarrassed him thoroughly by showing photographs of him when he was in goofy outfits to every one of his students, and I promised I wouldn't do that again because he had a fit with me after it was over. But I have told him if he ever gets in a situation where 
he feels uncomfortable, whether he's been drinking or whether other people are drinking. You know, and, and somebody says, you know, your drunk friend says, come on, let's hop in the car and go, and you're gonna get in a car with a drunk person and drive? Not a good idea, right? I've said to him, call me, no questions. I may get upset, but I'm gonna go get you, and I'm gonna make sure you get home. And I said, or don't call me. Call your, call your, your, your buddy that you know is sober, or call your uncle, or call your teacher, or call somebody, or just, Get out of there and Uber home. I'll pay for the Uber. You know, if you guys don't have Uber, I'm not promoting Uber, but it's, it's better than getting in a car with someone that's got alcohol on them, you know, or you drinking and driving. So think about what you're doing, these decisions. You're going to see some decision points. We're getting to the fun point in just a few minutes. You're going to see some of these decision points, and you need to think about them a little bit. You don't need to be the hero. You don't need to say to everybody, hey, you shouldn't be doing this, because I don't really expect anybody to really do that. But what I do expect from you all, and I hope you expect this from yourselves, is that you're not going to place yourself in a position where something bad can happen to you, because you got your whole future in front of you. And these little things make a difference, right? I wouldn't be the chief judge of the district court, and I had no idea. I, I wanted to be a, a, a lifeguard, basically, was my whole aspiration when I was younger. Um, and I'd still like to be one. Um, but I had no idea I was going to become a judge, much less chief judge. And if I had had any problems with my prior criminal record, this never would have happened to me. And I absolutely love my job. It's a privilege and an honor to serve the citizens of Maryland in my role. It's the greatest thing I've ever dreamed of doing, and I couldn't be happier doing it. So I don't want you guys to make some poor decisions. You will, you'll make bad decisions. At 18 and 16 and 17, you make bad decisions. The science shows that your brains aren't fully developed yet, and there's lots of literature on that. And so you can expect to make bad decisions. Just don't let them pile up, and don't make a lot of them, and don't make them worse. Just own it if you have to, and get rid of it. So thank you all very, very much for being here today. I appreciate you coming to this, and I hope you guys have fun. You're about to see the fun part pretty soon. So, Shane. It's all fun. It's all fun. He said it. I'm going to say it again. You're going to make a mistake. You're going to make a mistake again. You're going to make another mistake. It's all right. I make them. He makes them all the time. It's called an appeal when I make a mistake. You're going to make a mistake. Own it. Then make it right. By own it, what I mean is you're going to be with somebody. I have friends. He is my friend. Let me be a better example. That, hey, big tall guy. Tall guy. Ugly. That's him. <laughs> He's my friend. I've known him probably longest in the room. We've made some bad choices together, that dude and I. Some bad choices together. Bad choices, him and I. I've known him a very long time. There are very bad choices, but we did not compound it. We just called somebody else to come get us. We were drinking beers one time. He had like 18, I had two. Two was too many for me to drive, so we called someone to get us. I tell you that because he asked me to do it. I said, no, Wes, I don't want to drink a beer. He made me do it. <laughs> he made me do it. I tell you that because you got friends. They're going to encourage you to do some things you may not want to do. You may do them. It's okay. Don't make it worse. I'm not promoting Uber, but you all have phones. Uber. Or call your mom or dad. Because mom or dad or your friend or your cousin is better than calling, well, he's my friend, but Trooper Falls is not going to be your friend. Officer McKay will not be your friend. They're nice. They're good dudes. They'll also put you in jail. Now, before we go further, Dr. Alato, we've talked a lot about the education and what we believe, the, how the courts can help the schools in terms of what we do together as a partnership. Would you please welcome students on behalf of the school board and give them a little bit of what you think we should do here. Thank, Thank you, sir. You. Thank you. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Let me be really brief, but let me welcome you. Really delighted that you're here. This is one of my favorite times as a superintendent of 83,000 students and 127 schools. Um, that we're doing something really very different. So um, we're delighted that you're here. We're really thankful that Judge Spencer and this amazing team that he's put together that you're going to meet through the rest of the morning um, has welcomed us to his courtroom, right? So this is their courtroom. We are guests. And so we want to make sure that we act accordingly. This is kind of amazing what you're going to go through today. Um, and so I want you to sit back and I want you to relax, take a deep breath, and I want you to take it all in because it's pretty much what you're not expecting. So we talk a lot in Anne Arundel County Schools about providing opportunities 
and experiences for students. So there's all this stuff that happens in the classroom, really important, right? AP English and biology and algebra and all those really cool things. And that's really important because we're an educational system, right? We are schools. But we're trying to provide, always we talk a lot about providing those additional experiences, whether it's through your signature program at Broadneck, right? or your signature at Arundel, or a magnet program, or athletics, or you're a thespian, or you write for the paper, or whatever it is, we're looking for those different experiences and opportunities that expand you as a person, as a human, as a thoughtful being beyond the classroom. Today is one of those experiences. Today is one of those experiences that I believe I am so committed to that I try and get here every time, we do this four times a year, we try and get students from across not only private schools, but all of our county high schools in this courtroom at least once during the year, because I think this is one of those experiences that's not gonna show up on your transcript or your college application or wherever you head post-college, but it's one that's gonna have very meaningful impact on you as a person. So you're gonna see Judge Spencer interact with the folks up here they're going to interact with you. You're going to hear, as Judge Spencer talked about, you're going to hear from a trauma nurse. You're going to hear from local law enforcement. You're going to hear from state police, uh, the law enforcement from the state level. You're going to see district attorney. You're going to see, as a prosecutor, you're going to see defense attorneys. You're going to see real cases being tried. And during the course of all this, you're going to have some fun. You're going to laugh. I bet you're going to cry. I guarantee you, you're gonna think. And that's what today's about. The whole piece of this, the encompassing piece, the umbrella of this is making good decisions. Because making poor decisions lands you here in court. Making poor decisions gets you pulled over by a police officer. Making poor decisions could put you in the hospital or worse. And we don't want that for you for your classmates, for your school, or for your family. So one of the really cool things is you sit there as high school students wondering what's gonna happen next. There are people that you don't know that love you, that care about you, that want you to make good decisions. And many of them are sitting right here. You don't know them and they love you and they want you to do well and be well. So this is a really cool experience. I'm delighted we're part of this, that we're invited and guests into this courtroom four times a year. You guys are in for a treat. So sit back and relax and engage with what's going on. And you're gonna think, I guarantee it. Thank you, glad you're here. Thank you, Thank you. I appreciate it. Poor decisions aren't always involving drugs or alcohol, choice and friends. Poor decisions are sometimes just showing up do something you think is normal every day. Every day of my life, I do a few things. Well, same thing. I'm methodical about it, creature of habit. I carry coins in my pocket that I found heads up because I'm superstitious. I carry a blade in my pocket. It's about that big. Why are you backing up? <laughs> you ain't safe here? Are you safe? Bobby, you, there's Bobby. Yes, sir. He'll keep you safe. That's his job. You'll be all right. You'll be all right. <laughs> You sure? You all right? You sure? What about now? Oh. <laughs> you scared? I just need the cop to come over here. McKay, she wants to talk to you. You want to come over here? Here, come, come on. Awesome, McKay, can you help me out? <laughs> What's your name? Abriel. I'm Shane. This is my friend, Officer McKay. He'll keep you safe. How you Hi. doing? <laughs> I joke. I do have a blade in my hand. It's real. I keep one of these in my truck as well. Don't tell him that. <laughs> I tell you that because this blade in my truck, let's just leave it here for now, is there. It's a blade. It is what it is. It's a choice I made to leave that in my truck on any given day. Who drives again? Who told me to drive? <laughs> yeah. You want to drive with me? You want to drive my truck? Yeah. You, what kind of car you got? I mean, I don't have a car, but I drive. Whew, good. I got a car. You want to borrow my truck? Sure. Where are you going to go? All right. What's your name? Marcos. Marcos? Yeah. You go to Arundel. Yeah. You're a Wildcat. Good to meet you. Come on, man. Come on. Here, Marcos, you can drive my truck. Here's my truck right here, man. 
You be the driver of my truck. All right, bro? All right. Have a seat. Have a seat. Hold on, you like music? Yeah. What do you like? Anything, really. Anything? Yeah. Uh, let me think, let me think, let me think. Any music at all? <laughs> all right. You gotta have tunes in your car, right? Yeah. All right, I'll put that right here. You be the tune man. Anybody know Marcus over here? Do you know him? No. Come here, come here. What's your name? Come here. What's your name? Uh, Janae. Janae. You going for Rod Marcos? Uh, sure. All right, go ahead. Have a seat with Marcos. Okay. You know him? No, I don't. Oh. You go to the mall? Sure. Marcos, Janae, going to the mall. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> he don't know her. Y'all know them? What? You know them? Do you want to go with them? Why not? What's your name? Megan, I'm Shane. Hi, how are you? Come on, Megan. All right, Megan and Marcos, Janae, just chilling, going to the mall. Anybody else want to go to the mall? Do another mall? Come on, girl. <laughs> Hold on, what's your name, Megan? Caleb. 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 Do, do you know Marcos, Janae? No. And Megan? All right, let's go for a ride. Where are y'all going to go? The mall. Which one? Annapolis. Annapolis Mall, go ahead. Right. Cruise. Anybody, know, anybody want to be a law enforcement officer when they grow up? You do? A cop or something? DA agent? No. Thank you, somebody. Thank God. Come on. Every cop has to have a cool cop car. Lights and sirens, bro. All right, can you drive it? Can you drive it? Probably. Probably. Look, did you? Oh. Can you do that? All right, drive. Where y'all going? Uh, we're in H&M. Why are you looking at me? Look at the road! <laughs> Marcus, look at the road, not the car next to you. He didn't even pull you over yet. You go behind him, man. Oh. Oh, goodness. Oh, so look, right now, Marcus is going to the mall with some three people he doesn't know. They're all beautiful, attractive women. I'll give you that. He's looking at me, not the road. He's swerving. Awesome, okay, he's swerving. Dude, what you gonna do? Oh, Lord, have mercy. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Turn signal, oh, got it. All right, well. Go ahead, awesome, okay, we stop that vehicle for me? All right. How you doing, sir? Good to you, officer. Good, fine, fine. Reason I pulled you is swear over the yellow line on the way to the mall. Oh, for real? Mm -hmm. And also observed, you, also observed you in a high crime neighborhood on the way to the mall. Really? Yeah, what were we doing in Robinwood? Uh, headed to H&M. Did the H&M? Yeah. Okay. That's a dead end, that's a dead end community, right? No. All right. Well, we just had three homicides there last week. And it's a high drug community also. Do you know these people in the car with you? No. No? <laughs> well, when I saw you go in that neighborhood, you made several U-turns and you came back, went into a courtyard, came back, went back and forth. I was headed to the mall. You headed to the mall? <laughs> okay. Do you have your license and registration on you? Uh, no, I left that at home. No, you don't even have it on you? No, it's in my backpack over there. But... Oh, over there, okay. Yeah. Hey, John, I want to get up right here. Pause, time out in our, in our little episode right here. Right now, what we have is four individuals in the car. The driver just told Officer McKay he has no license registration on him. Not on him. That's one choice. Officer McKay, in light of that, what are you going to do next? Next, I'm going to get him, I'm going to get his, his information, her information, her information, everybody's information in the car. Feel free, proceed, sir. Do you have your registration or license on you, I'm sorry? No. No, do you have your license or ID on you? No. Ma'am, you? Over there. Over there? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sir, do me a favor, can you step out of the car for me, please? All right. Do you have anything on you I should know about? Uh, no. No? Anything okay. in this vehicle I should know about? No. No. Are you sure? Positive. Okay, were you being honest with me about your reasoning for being in that neighborhood? Yes. Okay. All right, do me a favor, come stand over here. Over where? Over here. Just come over here. Until I can figure out what's going on, oh, I'm going to put these on you. You're not under arrest right now, oh. but until my backup officer gets here, I'm placing these on what? you. What? Time out again. Miss Holly, Officer McKay has just taken Marcus out of the car, put him in handcuffs. You okay with that? Absolutely not. 
Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Holly is my friend. She's a public defender here in Anamona County. She says, as a member of the defense bar, that that man should not be in the car out of the cuffs. Or, I'm sorry, out of the car in the cuffs. Mr. Adams, you okay with this? Absolutely. Why, why is that, sir? Well, you've got four people. They're in a high crime area. He's got no, he actually could be arrested right now. He's got no identification on him. And so we don't know who he is, why he's here. Um, he's already committed a traffic offense. And because we don't have any identification on him, uh, he has the right to detain him. But even right now, he's still in the investigatory phase, so he's detained him for a brief period of time because there's four people and he's four on one. He's really just taking care of himself and his safety. So I've got no real issue with that. Mr. Holland, why are you upset with this? Because he's in handcuffs. He's in handcuffs? Well, it, it's a night and Officer McKay has no idea who he is and there's four people in the car. They don't know each other. I understand Officer McKay is going to call for backup and he's, uh, Front seat. because of officer safety concerns, he's got him briefly detained. Okay. Officer McKay, they're going to argue about this later in front of Judge, Judge Morris, but go ahead with your stop, sir. Not much I can do right now. <laughs> and ma'am, is, were you sitting in this seat the whole time? Oh, uh, yes. Okay. Are there any things in this car I should know about? I don't know. No? All right. Right, ma'am, like ma I need stopped. you. I need. All right, do me a favor. You, I need you to come out of the car. What are you? What are you reaching for? Ooh, all right, give me a favor. No, I don't. Yeah, you, you're you're being you're being suspicious right now. Ladies and gentlemen, did you hear what Judge Morrissey said? Kayla got out of the seat, was down on her hands and knees. Awesome case, by himself in a dark street. I'm pretty sure. He I put her in cuffs because he had no idea what she's reaching for. I'm pretty sure I saw I saw a knife. Oh, God. Miss oh. Holly, did you hear what she said? <laughs> Kayla said she saw a knife. <laughs> <laughs> Kayla saw a knife? What the? You never All right, me. come back here. Have a seat for me. Ma'am, I need you to step out. Mark those cases. Is this your, is that your knife on the seat? Uh, no. No? Oh. Wait, do I like the same cup? Damn! <laughs> Free me. All right, come over here, have a seat, please. Ma'am, you step out to me as well, please. Thank you. Were you sitting? In, were you in that seat the whole time? The back seat. You don't have any ID on you. How old are you? Sixteen. Okay. Do me a favor. You come and sit. Sit here, please. Time out. Time out. Time out, please. Time out. Let me help you. Let me help you. Let me help you. Earlier, you heard what Judge Morrissey said, and Ms. Holly mumbled it earlier that she's being nice. Sometimes you got the right to remain silent. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you ain't gotta say nothing. Sometimes you can just sit there and be polite. Yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir, say nothing. Because Kayla told me now twice, I was from Kay. There's a knife in that car somewhere, bro. What's your name? All right, Kayla, you, you and I have talked later on. Also, you can You got everybody out now. What you gonna do? Now that I have everybody out of the car, I'm gonna continue the search of the car. I found a dangerous weapon under the front seat of the car. Are you going to do a full search on the inside, or are you going to wait? I'm going to do a full search of the inside right now. Are you going to do that by yourself, or are you call your opponent? No, I'm going, to, I'm going to call for backup. If I, have a, if, I can get, if I can have other tools that I'm allowed to have, I'm going to call for those resources, well, if I can get them here. Can you call if you can get somebody bail? Okay. Dispatch, you have a dog. Can I have a canine? Respond to my location, please. Bring it out, yo. Get her. Bring it out. I could easily slip Ten four.
Hey. Good boy. Here, check there. Get him, Profi. Good boy, come on. Come on, good boys. Good boys. Hey, what's your name? Jalon. Did you see the dog? Yeah. What did you do? Good boys. Is that what happened? Did you see what he did? What did he do? He sat down. You saw him sit down? Trooper Foss. Yes. Did Euro sit down? He did. Uh oh. Twice, what is, actually. What does that mean? That means he alerted to the presence of the odor of narcotics. You said narcotics? Yes. You mean drugs? Yeah, well, yes. Uh oh. Now what are you going to do? Search the car. You, you mean like the trunk? I mean like the whole thing. Glove box. Glove box. The whole car. Trunk. You gonna hood. pull anything, in, anything out? Anything. Ms. Uh, Holly, right now, Trooper Foss was here in about eight minutes or so after a stop with four people who have no idea their names are, still running their names apparently. K9 comes, <clears throat> did a scan, an alert. Can we search the car now in your mind? Come on, Ms. Holly. Come on, Ms. Holly. <laughs> <laughs> Give it up. It's hard to say. Uh, yes. I'm, yes. Anybody <laughs> have a problem with the cops searching the car now? Yeah, Raise your hand. Marcos. <laughs> <laughs> the driver. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to note your objection. We'll tell your, your lawyer that in the future. Officer McKay, will you search that car for me, sir? Put me in a hard spot here. It wasn't me. It was your friend Kayla and Marcos who put you in a hard spot. <laughs> What'd you, uh, what, what? Yeah. Found a bag under the front seat, sir. Mm. So, so this is a bag? Got a bag with, appears to be to me about 75 grams of heroin. Oh my heroin? Heroin. Any other things in there that may be in crimes, in the issue of crimes, who might own it? Oh, I got a red jacket. Red sweatshirt here, red hooded sweatshirt. Megan. Don't, aren't the pages blue and red? Oh. Megan, uh -oh. what's that? Oh, Green t-shirt. Where do you go to school? 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 Rondo. All right. Mr. Adams. Yes. She goes to uh, Old Mill, Broadneck, Harbor, Arundel. They found 75 grams of heroin and a shirt from Arundel. Can you Are you going to use this in your, your case? In thing? Yes. Yeah. Why? In, uh, well, on the window, so. Because the bag presumably would have things that the, only the owner would possess. Huh. And given the location, which is underneath the driver's seat, and the fact that he goes to Arundel, and since the bag is portable, even though he's driving your car. Hold on. He, you almost said that. Because you don't go to a run, though. I'm going with the, the, the Arundel t-shirt. It's going to make Miss Holly, good Mr. Adams is going to hang his hat on that and say he's guilty. It must be a run, though. I'm going to disagree. Judge Morrissey, is that shirt admissible as evidence? I think it would be admissible as evidence. Wow. Why? Is it, is it circumstantial, maybe? That is. this young man, Marcus, goes to Arundel, bags in the car he's driving, and he had it? There, you know, as the... Judge, you have to use your common sense a lot of these times. It's not so much applying the law to the facts, it's what makes sense to you, right? And it seems logical to me that if he's in a car, there's a bag under his seat, he's got, he goes to a rundle, he's got a t-shirt that says a rundle, I'm gonna bet that that is his shirt. And so it is evidence that at least places him there in the car. And what Mr. Adams is gonna say is to you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, not you, because you're biased. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the shirt says, Arundel, they went to different schools. He's driving. It's in a bag he's sitting on. I ask you to convict that man of possession of drugs. He had so much he wants to sell them. That's a misdemeanor, like, what, five days in jail? No. Oh, no? That's a felony with up to 20 years in jail. Oh, no. My bad. I'm sick of the jail. Uh -oh. oh, wait, wait, wait. Wait, hang on, can you say that again nice and loud? I'm 16, I can't go to jail. Wrong. Wait, what? <laughs> Miss Holly. Wait. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> Miss Holly. You can't actually go to jail. There's a thing. Can I? Oh, Miss Holly, what are you going to tell the jury about why your client, Mr. Marcos, is not guilty? Because it was not his car. He had no idea what was in the car. He didn't knowingly possess anything in that car. And he didn't make any statements saying any of it was his. 
thank you. You probably should. <laughs> Circumstantial at best. At best. Not enough beyond a reasonable doubt. Say those were his trials. Um, Judge Morrissey, let's say this is a bench trial, and this is not a trial in front of a jury, 12 citizens from this county. This is a bench trial, and the evidence you have is what you see, that that man has driving the car, he's possessing the car, he's occupying the car, he has dominion control of everything in the car, the shirt says he goes to that school, he goes to that school, he's sitting on all that drugs. What's your verdict, sir? Guilty. Bobby, take them all. What? Let's go, folks. Where am I going? Lock up. Lock up. Now, as they go, Miss Holly, we're taking all of them. You okay with that? No. I am not, but I know that they're all going to be taken. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to hear that. Ladies and gentlemen, in all, in all seriousness, what I want you to hear is what Ms. Holly just said on the way out. You may not have heard across the room is that right now, Marcus is sitting on the drugs, the drug, drugs that have a shirt with his school mascot on it. He has no idea who's in the car with Megan, uh, Megan uh, Kayla, and Janae. But who got locked up? And you know what the def public defender said? That's going to happen. Now here's, let's talk about choices. Marcus drove my car. He's gonna get this knife in that car. It's a weapon. You gonna save me for the knife, where are you? Trooper Foss. Yes. See? What? Knife. Weapon, right? Weapon. It's my weapon. He's no idea it's in my car. Drugs. They're in my truck, my car. But I'm not in it. Marcus is with Janae and Megan. Now what? They're all charged. I tell you that because you leave a party. At a rondo, you get in the car with somebody from Old Mill, we're all cool. You have no idea what's in that car. Make good choices. Make good choices, right? The knife is in there. It's mine. I own the truck. I'm not even there. I'm home sleep. And they're all arrested. Now, let me back up five steps before we get back to the lawyers. Anybody have a problem, Officer McKay, pulling anybody out of the car? No? Yes. Why? Why? Hold on. You said yes. Hold on. I, I didn't have an option. Okay. She said, <laughs> I, heard, I heard you say, you tell them their rights. Ms. Holly, what rights should they be advised of right now? You mean their Miranda rights? So yes. He said they weren't under arrest, so Miranda wouldn't kick in. Oh, but he didn't say they were arrested. Now they're arrested. Now they're, they're getting ran out right now. Right now they're being Mirandized. Custodial but, interrogation is the key word for when Miranda rights attach. On the so streets, they have that's to start That's why I was asking. saying he was under arrest as soon as he put the handcuffs on. And that's why I was saying he wasn't, because <laughs> there's a thing called a Terry stop, which is a brief detention. I can stop you. Police officers can actually put you down by, with a gun, and it's still not an arrest. Did you hear that? That's, that's something that happens, and it's lawful. I'm not saying it's pleasant or OK. I, trust me, an asphalt sandwich is not fun. But if. <laughs> If Kayla's reaching in this car in a dark night and also doesn't know what she's getting, he's going to pull her out put her on the ground. He's going to pat her down. He's going to put her in cuffs. And none of that's an arrest yet. Not an arrest. No Miranda. And not fun. <coughs> choices. <coughs> Friends, places, times, choices. They're not bad kids. But you don't know them. No idea. And the problem is, oh. I was going to say, we're probably going to say the same thing. But here's the thing. Tiffany and I, Miss Holly and I can argue about that in a courtroom all day long. The, the thing is, at 2 o'clock in the morning, while you're sitting outside of Annapolis Mall, the choice that you make determines whether or not Miss Holly and I get to argue about it. You guys, I mean, you gotta look, you've got to do the right thing. Let the that's officer that's do his job. Let him, that's you know, let... Tiffany do, do her job. She does a really good job at what she does. Snapchatter. So and then what's worse is that he's going to drive by and Snapchat put you on a Snapchat <laughs> locked up in cuffs. Ah-ha! The problem is I saw a couple of faces that were like, what? You're OK that they're all going to be arrested? I don't come in until after you're arrested. At, at that point in time, the officer is going to charge you all constructive possession. That it's within your lunge, your reach, your grasp. As in Kayla in the back seat, Miss Holly? Yes. 
going to assume that you knew or should have known what was in that car with you. And our arguments come way after you've been arrested and way after you tell mom and dad or grandma and grandpa or your sister. What about the commissioner? Way after you go to the commissioner. How about the judge who says you have you all have that heroin? an attorney at 2 in the morning to try and get you out of jail, but you've been yeah. charged with distribution. Yeah. So, fella, that means not, you're in, not just simple possession. That means you're in big person court. You're, you're not in district court. court. You're in circuit court, trial court, and Judge Morrissey actually made a really good point. Oh, goodness. Judge Morrissey, we had a better of you for me? Sure. All right. All right. How many of you guys heard about the, when he said, I'm only 16? Anybody think the 16-year-old could come to adult court? I guess. How are you? Yes. You guys go with all 16-year-old absolutely can be tried as an adult. Okay. Um, we would have, depending on the circumstances, he has a weapon, he's got 75 grams of heroin, heroin is... Okay, come here. Come here. Stand right here. Stand right here. Judge Morrissey, it, it's now Monday, Monday morning at 1030, because this happened on a Friday night. They were held over the weekend. You have three individuals, all charged with the same offenses, possession of intent to distribute drugs, possession of drugs, uh, conspiracy there too, probably weapon as well. Uh, they're all minors, but they're all charged with felonies. You're going to have a bail review. What are you going to do now, Judge? So the things that I'm looking at in bail review are really come down to two issues, whether they're a danger to the community and whether they're gonna to return to court. Tell me. So prepared for me when they come, I'm gonna have your full criminal records and all the information that pre-trial, there's a group that will interview you and that they'll prepare a report for me and I will make a decision based on that as to whether I think you're a threat to the community or likely to show up to court again. Um, I'm probably gonna graduate what I do from the driver of the car versus the other three people and I'm gonna treat them differently based on it's more likely to me that the driver of the car, based on what we've already discussed, is the person that had the drugs. So you're gonna choose that Marcus wore this outfit a little bit longer than that? But probably gonna be a, something more. I'm not necessarily saying I'm gonna hold him in jail. I might let him out, but I'd put more restrictions on him as to what he can do and what he yellow, can't do when he's out than the other three. Thank you. I like orange on you too, girl. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Part of what I do is, is I would require you guys to remain in school to attend to all classes. I'd want reports weekly from your school to make sure that you're showing up for school. Drug tests? I would also have you drug tested randomly or at several times a week at they first. I could put a monitor on your ankle um, and have you done that. But what I really want is you guys to get back to school. Um, because as a judge, I'm trying to think about, I, I don't like to punish people. I don't like to sentence people to jail. That's not fun for me. It's an awesome responsibility. <laughs> it's an awesome responsibility that I take very, very, very seriously. And so what I really want is I want to alter their behavior in the future. And so how do I accomplish that with either setting a bail or with a sentence? Because jail doesn't always mean that that's going to make the person's behavior different. There could be other things. And that's kind of the last thing I have as my options. What I want them to do is become productive members of the community, like I want you all to succeed. That's what I want for these guys. I want them to succeed. And I really don't want to send them to jail if I can avoid that. I'm standing behind Megan because I know that Megan's wearing a skirt. You may not be able to see that. So Mr. George, my bailiff, didn't put her in a jumpsuit. That was a choice he made. He's a gentleman, he's nice, and he's polite. First one is a gentleman. We're good? He made that choice for her. She chose the beautiful blue dress. I like it. Thank you. He chose not to put her in a jumpsuit, unbecoming back there in front of all of them. But let's say they're not there. Bobby, you going to put her in a jumpsuit back there if they're not there? Um, in the detention center, holding center? Yes, she will. Not fun. OK. You know why? One choice goes to another, to another, to another, to another, and you're locked up and you're wearing a jumpsuit. And you're changing your clothes in front of random people you don't know. Now, we do that in locker room all the time. I get that. But that's with people your age, not 45-year-old grown men like, oh, me, not you. I'm me, old. not you. Me, yeah, not I'm you. Old. My I bad. My that. bad. Garrett County. All right. <laughs> now, <laughs> oh, I got a pole coming on. It's snowing in there right now as we speak. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask my friends to change out of their jumpsuits. You can have a seat, Megan, for me. Get you out of your jumpsuit if you don't mind, because I don't want you to sit in that all day. You want, you want to get out? Yeah, sure, sure. You sure? Yeah. Go that way. Before I move on, 
I think my friends right here saw it best, but Euro came in here and Euro's what started the whole process. Euro's my friend, True or False's partner. Anybody have questions about what Euro did or why Euro did it? About how he knew to go in there and search or why he searched the car? Anybody? True or False, how did you know there's something in the car? Uh, Euro gave me. Thanks for. Uh, so he's trained on seven different odors. He's trained to detect marijuana, hash, cocaine. Heroin, black tar heroin, ecstasy, and meth. Uh, those are his only trained odors, and he's only trained to sit for those odors. And, and, and a is, sit is his final response. This mock stop for us is, is not real life. In real life, in that had been in my truck, it'd be a raised truck that you know, Here, us metal and secure. My windows are all up. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't go in the car right, around, right away, would you? Mm -mm. Would he still be able to alert? Yeah. Even in, in the trunk of the truck? As long as odor's available, he'll be able to. So he'd do a sweep it. outside. If he, if, he did a, if he alerted, then what? If he alerted to the vehicle, then it's going to get searched from front to back, top to bottom. Anything no. inside of it, anything locked inside of it, everything's I, getting searched. Earlier I asked you, and we skipped over it real quick. I saw him sit, and you said he alerted twice. So is the alert, the only alert you know of a sit? Uh, for me, for, you. for me, I, can, I went through a 14-week school with him, so I know his different behavior changes that, to me, show that he's in odor in his trained odors, which is kind of close up his, he starts breathing through his nose instead of his mouth. His tail wags a little bit faster. He does different things, different things that I can read as his handler for now six years um, that I can, that I'm able to detect before we get the final response, which is a sit. Do air fresheners mask the smells? Uh, no. Actually, so, Judge Spencer's favorite, we'll call it the beef stew theory. You guys go into the, you guys go home and your mom's cooking beef stew, right? You guys smell beef stew. Well, the dog is able to smell the broth, the beef, the carrots, the celery, whatever else goes into a beef stew. They are able to smell it all separate. Um, that's what's great about a dog's nose is they can throw out odors they don't need. For example, air fresheners, coffee grounds, dryer sheets. How about cat urine? I heard of that one. Uh, anything that, any overwhelming odor is going to be easier for the dog to throw out because he knows he doesn't need it anymore. So overwhelming, you know. I heard a case of the day they had it in Tupperware, in a plastic bag, in a suitcase, in the trunk. As long as the odor is available, the dog will be able to detect it. How about in a locker at school? Sure. Might not be that exact locker because there's holes in them. <laughs> I haven't heard a duh in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't just a duh. It was so, a duh. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. So, the moral to the story is, her weed's not in her locker. <laughs> so we will search other than her locker, clearly. We were already right off. Right, yeah. They're like, oh, like, my God. Call that a clue, too. You guys just around, so. <laughs> mm. Mm -mm -mm. Um, I want to also tell you that we did this, and it's not our first time. We're, we're very keen and aware is that I had Marcus sitting right here, and I stood right in front of Marcus for a reason. I put the seats right there, Janae, for a reason. Because my boss is here, and my other boss is here, and if I let Trooper Foss walk over here, and that dog sat right here next to this young man, first off, he'd hate me. He'd lose his job, I'd lose my job. He'd be yelling at me, he'd be yelling, where's the chief? He'd put me in jail. It's a whole lot of mess. So the dog's over here for a reason, but trust, trust, that if you're a walk down here and walked up here, and even, not saying you are my man, but if my man had a joint in his pocket, you're always gonna go that way. And he's gonna try and sit that way. That nose is not just good, but it's crazy good. Uh, I tell you that because my friend here said, duh. Yes, through metal. Yes, through a trunk. Yes, through cat urine soaked uh, rags in the trunk of a car in a bag. Yes, that good. That good, Trooper? Yes. As long as the odor is available, the dog will be able to detect it. I'm sorry, Ms. Holly, what did you say? Right. Oh, so even if you're at the party and you smoke the blunt at the party, you get in the car and then go, you're in the car back seat. Wait, are you laughing? Hold on, hold on, hold on. One, no, no. Two, no. three, four, five, six. I'm about six here. I'm six in. Just keep, we'll keep our eyes on. Maybe, maybe we'll go to, maybe we'll go to Arundel for just a class trip. <laughs> don't, don't take that. Don't take that. Don't take that. Don't take that. That's my brother. Oh. That's my brother. Miss Enzo. 
Um, and guys, just keep in mind too, the, they complied and did a really good job of cooperating with the officers. Now if you don't cooperate, and Miss Holly kind of hinted at this, she doesn't come in and she can't help you until later. If you think you're being arrested unlawfully, it's not, you know, you don't think this is fair, whatever, arguing with the officer, not complying, you're just going to pick up more charges. There's failure to obey, there's resisting arrest, and every single one of those carries a period of incarceration. incarceration. So just make sure that if you are stopped, follow the, follow the orders of the officer, do what they tell you to do, and then talk to your lawyer about it later. Right then, you telling the officer that you're not going to do it, that it's not fair, I saw something on the internet that says you can't do this to me, that's not going to help you at all. The best thing you can do is comply, comply, comply. Then Miss Holly comes in later, and then she'll help you out. Take, it, take, it, a, the heritage. Oh, sorry. take it a step further. <laughs> Judge Morrissey said it earlier, and he has, does it all the time. Tells Officer McKay, Trooper Foss, that that was bad. That was not a good stop. That was an illegal search. That's his job. Let him help you. But when you're stopped, in the first 10 seconds, the first 10 minutes, and you're stopped, a please and a thank you, or yes, sir, no, ma'am, goes a long way. But doing this got you on video, punk. Got you. I ain't giving you jack, punk. <laughs> right there? In the first 10 seconds, he has discretion to cite you or not cite you, arrest you or not arrest you. And That's the choice he gets to make. Give him the right cho the chance to make a good choice because this saying, I got you on video, punk, may be your lawful right. But he says, hmm, jail, no jail, arrest, no arrest, ticket, no ticket. What's he going to do? Jail. Yeah, he's going to, if, if he has a lawful right, a reason he's going to. So let's, let's make good choices. It is and keep in mind that that's going to be in the report that I see when I'm, when I'm actually in court with it. So, I mean, if I have a case where it's a, tra a traffic stop and the person is very polite and cooperative versus someone who's a jerk to the officer, which one do you think is going to get a lesser sentence? I'm going to take all of that into account. And the officers do take very good notes when someone's not cooperative and when someone does mouth off and is doing all of those things. And just the last thing I wanted to bring up. Uh, as far as constructive possession, guys, that's not just cars. That's parties. That's anywhere you're at. So be very, very aware. If you're in a room with a bunch of people and someone has CDS or something they're not supposed to, the cops come in, everyone can be charged. So just be very, very aware. Don't so stop there. Oh, hold on one second. Don't stop there, Ms. Enzel, because even, even having a party with some beer, Ms. Chester, isn't it true that alcohol under 21 is still a civil infraction and we cannot expunge it? She said yes. So listen to me. That's a party with beer and liquor and wine, whatever it may be. You get cited. It's a fine. It's civil infraction. That's true. But it's on your record forever. All, and forever. You can't expunge it. So when you're applying to schools, they're going to go to University of Maryland, and they're going to pick me, clean record, her, party girl, just beer and wine, just beer and wine, judge. Party girl or me. Who are they picking? Clean. Not her. Financial aid. Financial aid, financial aid, scholarships for athletes, clean, party girl, rock star lacrosse player, field hockey, swimmer, whatever it is, clean, low level, third string, <laughs> D-back, slow. Slow. slow, rock star athlete, slow old dude, I'm going, I'm going. It's true, and even, even with law school, they, they ask that. Have you asked about a broke knees, man. I took his knees out. Getting contact with the police, it, it'll affect you Thank throughout your entire yeah. life. So just make make sure that you're cognizant of everything. Whenever you go to parties or whenever you're around people you don't know, um, it, it it can affect you for the rest of your life. So as Judge Hanks, hey, Judge, can I make some one piece since you had it out before? It's not just, by the way, the police officer problem, because. Is it, he's, our, he's our social media king over here, right? Yeah, my man. Because his social media king, too, has got your party on video. He's Snapchat, Instagram, and shoot, uploading it to something. And it's not just the police problem that you guys got to worry about with that. Because oh. college admissions are now asking for all of your social media handles. They're going to look. Every one of you guys knows now that, I mean, we can, I can point to a dozen examples in the last six or eight months of coaches who are pulling scholarships because of what you're posting on social media. And so if you're the two-time state wrestling champ who's posting a beer bong on his social media, 
which just cost him $200,000 in scholarship money, like real money, not going to the store money. 200K, that's what it costs to go to school. That, that's legit. Hold on. You have a question? No, but uh, if, if, uh, like, if businesses see that video too, they're probably gonna be like, oh no, I don't wanna hire this one. Not gonna do a job either. Right? No, we right. look at that too. And, yeah. and we're also looking at social media. So if you're charged, <laughs> we're going through all of that too. So be very, very cognizant about what you're posting. I had a theft yesterday where we tied this guy to several thefts at sunglasses cuts because he posted pictures in the sunglasses and in the same clothes he was wearing in the store. And I'm right, so when Marcos posts, uh, when Marcos got a picture of him at the Arundel varsity baseball game with his, you know, Arundel baseball shirt on that he's styling. On the cell phone that we see? Yeah, yeah that, the that's the one right there. Before we change gear momentarily, before we go, anybody have questions they want to ask the officers before they get out of here? They have to go back to work. Man in the far right. Okay. Ah, great question, because how old are you? I'm 16. Charged. No, no, no. <laughs> it depends on, there's two, there's two things. One, it depends on what the charge is. So there are certain felonies that if you are 16, you are automatically an adult. There are, and then if you're 14 to 16, you can be put back down into juvenile court. However, with almost any felony, we as prosecutors can ask a judge to review certain factors, your size, your age, your maturity, your independence, the, the nature of the crime, and ask for somebody to be treated as an adult. The youngest person that I have treated as an adult was 13 years and 11 months, and he's in jail for 85 years. What do you do? What? What do you do? What do you do? For what? He, a crime. Yes, sir. A big crime. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask the officer, I forgot your last name. McKay. McKay, okay. all right. Um, have you ever dealt with uh, one of those People who say that they're like free citizens and don't citizen. comply with American law. Yeah. Oh, quite, wow. quite a few times. <laughs> Judge Morrissey, have you? Yeah. <laughs> Many times. It happens in court. A lot of times they'll come up and they'll put a flag up or they won't even recognize their name because they claim that their name's copyrighted. It's nonsense. Um, I get a lot of correspondence that way too, and they spend an extreme amount of money on postage and stamping. Um, but it really is, it, it's, you know, Leslie Snipes, the, the actor, went to jail based on that because he didn't pay his taxes because he thought he wasn't a, you know, natural citizen of the United States. It's, the best I can say is it's nonsense, it's going to get you in trouble. Um, and it just kind of, it's funny in a way, but it's disruptive to the court proceedings and people like that tend to get go out that door rather than back out that door because they're not complying with the court. Remember in court, I have the power to look over at Bobby and say, I need this person detained because they're causing a disruption. They're creating contempt of court. I want you to take them. And I can incarcerate the person for any period of time that I find appropriate as long as it's not cruel and unusual punishment. It's pretty awesome power when you think about it. And just to, to go back on your question, Sunday, Easter Sunday, um, I had an experience, I pulled one over Easter Sunday evening. There was a gentleman who was born in 1957 who was claiming to be a sovereign citizen. I pulled him over for a taillight out. I walked up to his truck. He rolled his window down that much. He didn't say a single word. All he did was just took his papers, threw them out the window on the ground, claimed he was a sovereign citizen, and I had to deal with that. And he, I initially pulled him over for a taillight out, and it went a lot higher than it should have been. He, he initially could have just gotten a warning. He ended up leaving getting a, a few citations. Choices. Choices, ladies and gentlemen, choices. Ma'am, you had a question? Yeah, I'm just wondering, do you guys have a reason to get the, like, can you just, for the dog to, to search your car? Like, a normal traffic stop, you can just let the dog go through, or do you have to have? The answer is yes and no. Uh, Officer McKay pulled over the car here. Um, he had a weapon there. If it's five minutes, dogs in the neighborhood, why not? You okay with that, Ms. Holly? You always put me in terrible position. <laughs> <laughs> it's not in her nature to yes. agree. She's a public defendant. The answer to her is when she wants to discuss it, yes. So the answer is if Officer McKay calls Trooper Falls over and he can be here in a reasonable amount of time for him to complete that traffic stop, the law says it's fine. It's 
Yep. It's fine. fine. But he has to do that traffic stop and own that traffic stop. If, for example, it was just Marcus in there and Marcus had a license and he wrote him a ticket, gave it to him, and then the trooper got there, Judge Morris should probably throw that case out saying that's too long. That's not an unreasonable stop and that's a new arrest. But in the... None. The, 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 the trooper can walk through, he could walk through with his dog. So one of the ones we have recently is the troopers outside of the stadiums, just walking the dog in the middle of the stadium, picking up any odor that occurs. You have no, prote there's no protection. So it deals with your expectation of privacy right. and what constitutional guarantees you have. And I mean, that's, as long they as the dog is do it whenever they want to, and, right. and then it's a question. You have no court, privacy right? expectation on the road out there and there. In your car, inside, absolutely. Dog go outside your car. If he alerts, then they're going to get in your car. Mm -hmm. Yep. Then, because in, in real life, they, the car, dog would be outside of the car. He would not come to your home and do that. He'd go get a warrant for that if he wanted to. <laughs> you have a couple of questions. Yes, ma'am. Um, so, going back to like, the demonstration that we had, um, so since he didn't have, like, either of them didn't have, like, a license or whatever, but especially the driver didn't have his license, but the car wasn't his, could the person, like, the car belongs to be charged, be allowed, because he allowed... It's my car. car, that's ask. So it's my car, uh, Officer McKay, you pull them over, uh, Trooper Faustin, you're alert, you gonna charge me? If, it, if it's your car, sir, and he had a substantial amount of drugs, marijuana, everything else, then not only are you going to charge, but I'm going to write a search and seizure warrant and then come to your house and search your house and everything else that's associated my with house? that vehicle. Yes, sir, your house. My house? Yes. My whole house? Your whole house. Ms. Holly, can you get to my house, please? We're going to have a search warrant party over there, apparently. <laughs> totally. The answer is they're going to get a warrant. They're going to, they're and we're going to seize the car and try to take the car from him, too. Car's gone. The car's going to be on the lot. Charged and convicted, Judge Spencer. Probably not, unless they could prove he knew at the time what was in there and he had some tie to it. But they could go search his house and they could forfeit the Wes just said, Mr. Adams just said, I try to seize it and forfeit it. He could lose his car because it's tied to drug related activity. So, you know, there could be other consequences besides just getting charged criminally. Think about that choice I made. Dear Chief Judge Morsey, how are you, sir? Yes, it's 2 a.m. I'm sorry, Judge. Yes, Chief, I'm arrested. Yes, Chief, it was a felony. Why, Chief? Well, see, I lent some 16-year-old my car because he wanted to go to the mall, and, well, he got arrested. Uh, drugs. 75 grams. Fired? <laughs> yes, Chief, I'll turn my robe and gavel in. <laughs> I don't know those kids, but I gave them my car for no reason. I didn't know that dude. Because so you asked. <laughs> I'm a nice guy. Do you have a question? We have one over here. Yeah. Sure. Where? Yes, ma'am. So even though that those videos were part of the illegal possession, did you arrest them because they were an accessory? No, they were part of the illegal possession. That was so. You heard Miss Holly say a term called constructive possession. Just because it's not in your hand doesn't mean under the eyes of the law you don't possess it. So as long as it's within, and she said, reach, lunge, or grasp. So I think with one of them was sitting right back. Kayla was here. sitting there. You saw Kayla reach, right? She, act, that, she actually proved what possession. That's what constructive possession is all about. And it's the same thing. If you're standing here, so you're standing here and I like, drop your whatever little baggie of 75 grams of heroin right here in the tree stump behind you. You're not, you're not, it's not actually in your hand, but you are possessing that. And I'm talking to them, so so am I. Yeah. And, oh, that sucks. The argument, usually in the car, you guys are all going to be friends, right? You usually typically don't drive around with people you don't know. So they're going to be your friends, and if, if one of your friends has weed on them, and you come into court and say, I had no idea he had drugs on him, yet he's my best friend, do you think I'm going to believe that? I, again, common sense, right? The judge uses common sense in there, and I'm going to be like, yeah, I knew everything my best friends were doing, man. We were all part of it, right? So I'm going to know whether he's holding or not. You got to be careful about that because, you know, you may not be doing it, but you know your best friend's doing it, and yet you're going to go to jail as, as equally as he's going to go to jail. Before we move on, dogs have to go to the officers. Any more questions about the officer or the dogs? Yes, ma'am. Is there ever a situation where someone tried to take the dog? <laughs> 
Uh, Hold on. That, that, that dog be... is sworn, first off. That dog is sworn <laughs> off. That would be a very bad day. That would somebody. be a bad day for a bad person. Because yeah. A, dog has teeth that I don't want on my leg. And B, that's an assault on an officer. And C, that's his partner. And D, his roommate and his fourth child. It's going to be a bad day for somebody. No. No. Uh, Officer McKay, I got something for you. Yeah, here you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he found it. Now he's been arrested, charged, <laughs> and bailed out. <laughs> awesome. More charges. <laughs> All right. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to change gears. Yes. Before we do that, I'm going to thank Austin. Awesome. Uh, one more question. How many dogs do you know at a scene? At a scene? Like, Tell her. I mean, that all depends on what we're doing. Like, if we're doing a search warrant of a house, sometimes we've had two dogs. Uh, I also carry a bomb dog. So when we work the stadiums, we'll have six to eight dogs. It all depends on what we're doing. If we're tracking a felony suspect, we'll have two, three, maybe even four dogs, some bloodhounds, some patrol dogs, and we'll be tracking for miles and miles and miles. Mm -mm. Officer McKay, Trooper Foss, thank you both very much. Euro, thank you very much. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Go ahead, sir. Robin, when you said that's a high crime area, you can use that as a reason for suspicion. So I was like, standing up I, I, can, I, could, I could use that just as a reason to conduct an investigative stop. So if I was standing. If I was standing at the 24 bar and just standing outside, just hanging out, could you I walk up to you and say, what are you doing? I could go, I can come over and I can initiate a conversation with you, trying to determine what you're doing, what you're up to, and I can then conduct a field interview. Did everybody hear that? He asked whether being, can you just say it to me again, being in a high crime neighborhood gives you any special rights? Did you ask the question about being in a high crime neighborhood? And then he asked him, what if he's just standing outside the, what if he's just standing outside the Royal Farms or whatever? Can, can officer talk so to him? I had a case a couple years ago where there were four individuals that were standing, they were walking down a sidewalk in a high crime neighborhood and they had handkerchiefs out of their back indicating that they were gang members typically, um, showing their colors. And three of them ran. Well, flight gives the officers probable cause to believe that some criminal activity is foot. The, the fourth guy just stood there, and they came over and searched him, and he had a knife on him, but he didn't run. He didn't do anything. And so the issue to me was, is the fact that he's in a high-crime neighborhood doing nothing, but three of his friends ran when the police came. Is he guilty of having that weapon on him or not? And I found him not guilty. Um, arguably, some judges would have found him guilty, but I find that the Constitution doesn't work differently in a high crime neighborhood than it does in a low crime neighborhood. It works the same everywhere you are. And you have to give some indication of criminal activity before the officer can come over and stop you and frisk you. Um, those are the arguments that we hear in court. And Madam Public Defender will make that argument very strongly. And Mr. Adams will make that argument in the opposite direction. And we have to try to find that balance as a judge somewhere. And, it, and it, Sometimes it could really go either way, and I find myself using the standards that we have beyond a reasonable doubt. In my mind, that means I got to be really confident that I'm making the right decision. And I've sat there sometimes when it comes time for me to give a verdict, and I'm struggling to figure out which way I'm going to do, and that makes it easy for me because then they haven't proved probable or, or beyond a reasonable doubt to me. And I know they haven't because I can't quite make the decision. So. Yeah, thank you. It's always great to see you. We're going to change gears momentarily. We're going to dim the lights. I'm going to show you a video. It's a video of someone who's much like you, a high school kid, uh, around this time, spring actually, and uh, something tragic happened. This is not something that we just uh, YouTube made up. This is a real life video, a real life story that I find to be impactful and I would like you to watch it. Take a look for me, please. I always love sitting in the back of the room, standing in the back of the room as y'all watch the video. I've seen the video, I've seen it a few times now. I always enjoy sitting in the back of the room because I like to see who it impacts most. And I always have a hunch who it's going to be. When there are parents of students here, the parents cry first. 
Dr. Arlotto allows me to do this program with the school board. I had great relationships with people like Mr. Hood. Dr. McMahon is a big advocate of this program. She's the assistant superintendent. Mr. Crane, I saw you. You wouldn't even look at it, man. You're like me. I never met Mr. Crane. I knew he was coming. I just see the impact of this video because if it's not fresh, if it doesn't touch somebody, then I'm doing my job wrong and I failed. I'd love to watch the biggest, baddest dudes in the room who grit on me and give me that mug face the whole time I'm in the program. You know who you are, because I won't look at you now, but you know who you are. I love watching you look away when someone's snot being sucked out of their nose. That's real. That's every day. No, not every day for me. I don't understand the science. I'm not the smartest dude in the room. I recognize that. So my opinion, when you're part of a team, you know when you're weak, you get somebody who has the knowledge, the skill set. No matter what sport you're playing, what activity you're partaking in, education, whatever you're doing, if you're weak in that area, get somebody who can help you do it. You made a bad choice, get somebody who can help you get out of it. I made a bad choice because I like that video, but I don't understand all of it. So I made a better choice. I made it right. I got new friends. Ashley George is my friend. She's a nurse. I'm a lawyer. She's a nurse. She's smart. I'm just a guy who likes to talk a lot. <laughs> but she understands the science. But more importantly, the science, what was in the video that you may not understand what's going on. Or more importantly, she sees every day people like Sean and Rob. This is my friend Ashley. She's going to tell you a little bit about this video you saw, but her everyday life and what she sees every single day. Not grown folks who are old like me and Judge Morrissey, people like you. Ashley. Hey, good morning. Thanks for having me. My name is Ashley. Um, I'm a trauma nurse at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore in the emergency department. Um, thank goodness I only do adults. I know you know this. Um, but we do see adults like Sean and Robbie because we take everybody 15 and older. Um, if you have any questions, Please, that's what I'm here for. Please raise your hand and let me know. Otherwise, I'm just going to try to explain to you some of the things that maybe you didn't pick up if you're not familiar with what happened. Um, the first thing is, is that what they don't tell you is there were three kids in the car that day. There was a female. Um, she was ejected from the car, um, and she died um, pretty instantly or very soon at the site of the accident um, from her injuries. Um, Robbie, the second boy that you saw, um, he, will, he will never get better from that, but um, what they were trying to do is um, your memory, your muscles have memory, and so if you use that muscle, like they picked his hand up and they were trying to make him brush his teeth, your muscles have memories, and so by utilizing that same muscle, they were trying to help him regain some function. Um, he'll never breathe on his own. He had a tube in his neck, which is called a trach. That trach was, um, had a vent, a ventilator connected to it, and that was breathing for him. Um, you could see if you saw um, both Sean and Robbie had um, their heads were kind of misshapen. Um, they both had uh, what's called a skull flap removed. It allows their brain to swell so that it doesn't get crushed by the, the skull. It, the brain can swell and then take time to heal back down. So they remove the part of your skull and then close it back up to give your brain time to heal. Because when you have a um, your, your brain gets traumatized, your brain gets injured like that, it swells up when it's injured, and if your skull is on there, it, it causes damage to the brain. Um, the injuries that probably happen to these boys and that can happen in a lot of car accidents um, is you're, in, you're driving, you slam on the brakes, or you hit something, and your brain inside your skull bangs forward on the front of your skull, bangs backwards on the back of your skull, and swells and gets injured like that. So both boys did have significant brain injury. Um, Sean, the first boy that you saw, he had um, several tubes going everywhere in his nose, both sides of his nose and into his mouth. Um, the, one, the one tube in the one side of his nose was breathing for him. It was a tube going all the way down into his lungs and that tube was breathing for him. He had one tube going into his mouth, which was probably um, to suck up all the secretions in his stomach so that they didn't go into his lungs if he coughed or if you know, he, they got, by gravity, came back up. Um, he did have significant damage, bandages, blood. The, the skull was removed from the front of his head, which tells me that that's probably where his brain was swelling. 
um, and and like the the video said, they were maybe smoking some weed, but they just ran a stop sign, and maybe a second sooner or a second later, it might not have happened, but it did because that was just the timing, and because of that, one girl died. Uh, Sean, they took off the ventilator, they removed life support, and he died, and then Robbie is still, still alive, but he's no more functional than that. Paraplegic. Yeah, he'll never, he'll never be independent again. Um, does anybody have any questions about what they saw? Yeah. When was this? About six, seven years ago. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't in Anamore County, but it was in Maryland. Baltimore, yeah. Baltimore County. He, yeah. Rob and, and Sean and the young lady that uh, Ms. George told you about, she passed. Were high school students. They were out on a joyride. You heard Dad say they were on a joyride, um, skipping class. Uh, let's be honest. Let's keep it real. We all skip class. I, I skip class. I'm not gonna skip these classes, okay? But we skip class. I get that. <laughs> so skip the class that you're in now. Um, I understand that. But they skipped class. Left school. Left school with four friends. Left school and now there are only two friends. And of the two. Uh, Sean's still a, a paraplegic. A little bit of weed. That's all it does. Ashley, tell me weed. Uh, I say weed, we say marijuana, but tell the, the, the science. It, 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 it doesn't make our reaction great, right? Right. Um, so it, you know, it, there's a lot of controversy about legalizing marijuana right now, but the fact is, is that if you get behind the wheel, it slows your reaction time down so much so that if you were driving and you were in the same situation but you weren't high, you might be able to stop in time. But once you're under the influence, your reaction time just is slow and you just can't stop in time. So that could have been, you know, what happened or they just missed the, the stop sign. Not a myth, it's factual. And science says that I heard you whisper in my ear over here, dude. Don't let me drug test you. Um, it's not a myth, um, it's factual. But let's be honest, I don't care how many of you drive, none of you are as good a driver as me. By definition, I've been doing a lot longer than you have. None of our, I'm not a good driver as Bobby George, because Bobby George has been driving longer than me and he's been trained professionally. He's an officer and he had to go through uh, defensive driving and then the pursuit driving, things of that nature. So obviously, by definition, he's better than me. But no, don't get it twisted. That one joint slows your time down. Your reaction time down. And if you're an athlete, you see me looking at you, y'all know I'm looking at you. If you're an athlete, well, don't think how I'm in great shape. I used to be in shape. If you're a student, don't think, well, I got straight A's, no big deal. Let's keep it real. Let's say you have less than 10 grams of marijuana, civil citation, but you smoke weed and you drive. That's still a crime. You're still going to jail for a year, a thousand dollar fine. But who cares about that? Who cares about that? The most important thing? Ms. Crane, you have kids? I do. I have an 18 year old son and a 16 year old. That was why I was so impacted. Yeah, I, I, have, I have one of them, a 16 year old. And Ms. Crane, you and I have something in common is that we're, so, we're sons and we have sons, we're children. And I'll tell you, I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. I make them every single day of my life. I make them sitting there as a judge and I get off and I'm mad at myself. I fail at a lot of things that I do in my life. I fail at everything in my life so far, frankly, except for one thing. I'm still working progress on my kids. I'm going to keep working at it. But I failed as a father. Somehow my son's pissed off at me. My daughter's upset with me. I failed as a son, a husband, a brother. And I failed as a son, most importantly. I'll tell you this why. Because Mr. Craig and I, we're, we're, we're dads. But the worst thing we can do as sons, because he's a son of somebody, Make our mothers cry. Ashley's here today. I don't know where her brother is. Ashley's dad's here today. Ashley's mom sometimes comes. My dad sometimes comes. And my dad and her mom both cry. I've seen adults crying here. The worst thing we're going to do, son or daughter, is make your mother cry. I promise you that. I promise you that. You can let them down. You can make that right. You can anger them. You can make that right. You can upset them. You can make that right. When you see Ashley and she does all she can do in the ER to save your life, she does her God's best to save your life and she cannot do that and you're dead, you can't make that right. You can't make that right. 
I want you to have a good time. Some of you are going to be juniors and seniors. You're going to party for your senior prom or party for the junior prom. Just party because you want to party. Maybe I'll win a baseball championship. Invite me to the game if you go. You're going to celebrate the party if you win a big game. I don't know that, but make good choices. Because if you're seeing Ashley, you made a horrible decision. And you made it worse by doing whatever it is to get to where she is, and you're laying down, and Ashley's going to spend some of her time brushing your teeth. Any questions about the science or what was going on with Sean and Rob? Do you want to ask Ashley? Right there, one. Yes, sir. So they don't think that part of the school is, is that because the brain only swallows the brain swallows the whole brain swallows? No, they, I mean, they want to leave protection for your brain. So they only take like a, it's like maybe that big. They only take that much um, to give it room to swallow, but they want to leave protection. So the whole brain itself can swallow? Mm -hmm. the, the, whole, the whole brain swells, yeah. But different, right, different parts of your brain control different things. Um, the front part of your brain um, is, is doing all of your judgment, all of your thinking. The middle part does all of like your movements and your senses and your breathing. All that stuff's important. Ashley, something about the science about the, the cerebral cortex and when it's at its maximum <laughs> capacity growth or its final formulation. How old are you? Bless you, Jeremy. Uh, in your mid-20s, 25, 26. And what, is that, what does that control, what does that do? Uh, your, your judgment. Your personality, all that stuff is not fully formed until you're in your mid-20s. Did you hear that? 25, when your brain is fully formed to make good decisions. <laughs> I'm an old man. I've been with my wife since I was 17 years old. So I told her for the first 17 to 12, 25, 26, was that all those bad choices I made, I wasn't ready yet. I wasn't grown, right? I wasn't grown. The problem was when I got 25 and older, and now I'm 45. She's still married to me, surprisingly. I tell you this because I'm going to tell you it's going to be okay to make a mistake because you're not ready yet. You're not fully grown yet. Your brains aren't developed fully yet. I actually just told you that. It's okay to make a bad choice. Make it right and own it because you're going to. It's okay. It's science. But don't make it worse, right? Don't make it worse for me. Yes, sir. Yes. And in this case, Sean and Rao's decisions were impaired by the, by the marijuana. My brain will never be as big as probably everybody in this room in here. I'm not that smart. I get that. But it's about choices. And at their age, Sean's Rob's age, their choices were impaired by A, some marijuana, and B, because their brain's not fully developed. So I would love for you just to, to, when you make a bad choice, make it right. Wait, you think when you make a bad, you make a bad choice, make it right? Yes. You know how you make it right? Let's say you're hanging out at a party and your friend made a mistake, and you're where you shouldn't where you be. Call your mom. Call your dad. Call a friend. Get a ride. Don't make it worse for me. Your friends, you don't know the person who says he's a friend, you don't know who he is or she is, don't go with them. Don't get in the car for me. Before I ask this down, any more questions for Ashley? Yeah. yeah. Have you seen any cases where marijuana is laced with something? Yeah. Um, so actually, I just heard about the very first case of somebody dying from marijuana laced with fentanyl. We've, and had, two in, we've had two in Anne County. Rodney, right? Is that you guys? Yeah. yeah. You guys have one of them? And the other one's a 19 year old, I can't remember where the other one is. Both of them uh, fentanyl laced marijuana. Mr. Adams, my dealer would not lace my weed with fentanyl. Yes, he would. No, he wouldn't. Yes, he would. He's a good dude, I know him. And no, he would. And it's about money, it's not about whether they like you, Judge Spencer. I, I get a good score from that dude. And can you tell if it's laced with fentanyl? No, not at all. How small is the fentanyl? Oh, I, I mean, hey, you guys, do me powder. Me Everybody hold out your hand for a second. Put, put, I want you to look and put, Eight grains of sugar in your hand. Eight grains of sand. Can you all imagine that? That's enough to stop my heart. That's enough fentanyl to stop my heart. There's this stuff called car fentanyl. Have you heard about that? Yeah. yeah that tranquilizer. Put it down to one grain of sand. One grain of sand. How many of y'all seen that in your weed? 
<laughs> Anybody seen that? And how many of you guys want? Hold on, hold on, hold on. You still hot in your weed? <laughs> how many of you guys? How many of you guys want some weed head on a corner mixing up, mixing up, on eight grains of sugar into whatever it is that you're going to put into your body? Who's going to trust that guy? Fentanyl is what anesthesiologists use to put you to sleep before a doctor cuts your body open. That's how powerful it is. Before they cut your body open, and when they do that, you've got, you know, the electrodes on your body. There's a, a a thing called a crash cart that keeps you alive in case your heart goes into cardiac arrest. There's tubes and stuff. There's a thing that goes down. You're, you're intubated so that it can help you breathe. That's how fentanyl is used. It's used by a doctor with four years of college, four years of med school, two years of working before they give it out on their own. Ashley. Five, five years of working before they oh, give it out. Sorry, five years. Residence. Oh, you had a question That's here, why sir? we have Ashley there. Yeah. Oh, it was just a comment. First of all, fentanyl is expensive, so the people who are lacing... Wait, wait, wait. Wrong. Wait, wait, fentanyl, wait. it costs one-tenth... Right, right now, it's cheaper than heroin. One-tenth the amount of heroin. A $30,000 volume of heroin costs $3,000 of fentanyl. But that's, that's because of the dosage and how it affects you. Like, a lower dose of fentanyl will affect you more than a lot of heroin. Can you go get Justin, right. please? Lisa, can you call Justin back, please? Wait a second. Wait a second. People who are lacing the weed with fentanyl, I'm sure they're, they, the users who they're selling to know because I don't think they no. will. No, that wrong. would be wrong number two. <laughs> let, me tell, let me tell you about, let me tell you about uh, Memorial Day last year, two years ago. Memorial Day two years ago, maybe 9, 10 o'clock in the morning, we get our first overdose. They come in and we give them Narcan, which is the antidote to heroin or to narcotics, same as pills. The second one comes in, a couple of minutes later, the third one comes in. And finally we said, what is going on? And the first guy that overdosed, he said, uh, well, the, the dealer that I always go to, he's given away um, a Memorial Day taster, is what they call it. They give you a little a dose, a taster. Well, guess what? All those tasters that he gave away to free to all these people, they all overdosed. And they had no idea that there was fentanyl in it. I will agree with you that some people know when a dealer has something hot like that, that there are users that will flock to that because they know that is the highest edge that they can get on their high, and they're willing to play Russian roulette with it. But the, I believe the Broadneck student, it was passed to him. It was not what he did not choose to put himself Is that a that risk way. you want to take? Also, also I'm asking the question. Hold on, Chesley. I'm asking you. Is that a risk you want to take? Hypothetically. Is that a risk that you think your friends should take? Come on, man. And then for even for the, like, understanding that you don't even know how well it's mixed. It's not like somebody takes whatever quantity of fentanyl that they're cutting into the stuff that they're pushing on the street, and it cuts in equally so that the pill that you get has the same concentration of the pill that Marco gets. By that, I guarantee what he's trying to say is that student who's selling that fentanyl laced marijuana got a D in chemistry. Didn't even make it to chemistry. <laughs> he didn't even pass ninth grade biology, or she, and she's selling the drugs to your students, your peers, your school. Look, I get the rationale. Like you're trying to argue rationally, Wait, and you guys, just listen to me for one second on this. You guys are trying to think rationally, which is great. Your students, you're do going through this logically. What we are talking about isn't logical. Dude, pushing stuff on the street, it's not logical. You could sit here with a great rational, debatable argument that you as a student should come up with. We're talking about the real life consequences of some fool who doesn't care whether you live or die. He doesn't care whether it's mixed properly. We deal with that fallout. Your mom and dad, when they bury you, deal with that fallout. So I think it's great that you can academically confront me with some concept about whether or not a kid knows or should know or doesn't know. But the truth is, it kills you. We've had 51 deaths this year. 25 of them have made it through the office of the chief medical examiner. That means that they've had the toxicology done on the dead person. They've taken their blood, they've seen what chemical is inside of their blood. 20 of those 25 that they've confirmed, straight fentanyl. The other four of five are heroin fentanyl mixture. 24 out of 25 cases are dead from fentanyl. I got one dude who's died from a heroin overdose. One. 
please. I, I mean, I know you guys can argue it's great, your students, it's just not the truth of what's going on. Ashley, Tr go ahead. Trust me when I say that they're not, the, the dealers are not telling who they're dealing to what's in it. I know that, like, they might, they might, might know their dealer, might be their next, next door neighbor. The dealer does not care if shame overdoses. He's still selling, he's still getting money. <laughs> and, it, it, and it might not even be that he's that they're purposely putting it in the marijuana or whatever. It, I mean, it's so sensitive that we just had a meeting with our um, all of our ca county chemists, and none of us are allowed to even handle the bags in court because there could be residue on the outside that could kill us. Like even, mm -hmm. and they said that even when they open the bags and close them, they can't prevent the dust and like the residue from coming out. And if we were to get that on our fingers and somehow it be ingested, we could die. So it, it could be, say your dealer's also mixing heroin and whatever, and he's also doing, you know, he's also um, wrapping, or, wrapping or, weed or, and, or bagging. And or bagging it and weighing it on the same scales. You don't know what else he's doing. It could, it could get in it that way. It might not be purposeful, but it's still happening. One, one last thing I wanted to just share, Judge Spencer, and uh, Zach, who's coming in, we'll talk about this too. He's my brother, he's a firefighter. They carry, firefighters, and I, and I think a lot of police officers now are carrying Narcan. Narcan is the antidote uh, to heroin and pills and stuff like that. Um, if you ingest and you overdose, meaning you're not breathing, they can give it to you. It takes away your overdose and you wake up. The problem is, is that was created for things like heroin. Things like fentanyl and especially car fentanyl, they're having to give six, seven, eight doses in order to, to wake somebody up, to bring them back and they don't carry. My brother, Zach, who's a firefighter, he gets two doses of Narcan that they can give you. That will not wake you up from a fentanyl overdose. You need sometimes two just to wake up from a heroin overdose. So let me tell you, if it happens, there might not even be enough to save you, which is sad by the time you get to me. And the second part of Narcan is that the half-life of, of Narcan is about half of the time oh, yes. that it, the heroin will affect you. So you may have enough Narcan to bring you back to life, but when that chemical agent stops working on your body, you still have the powerful effect of- you Overdose again. Yeah, you re-overdose. We just had a kid who was hit with seven hits of Narcan, and about three hours later, they had to send him into the ER because he had had so much um, fentanyl in his system. I, I'm so confident, first of all, Ashley, thank you very much for your helping, uh, helping me, helping our students, our friends understand. Can we give Ashley a hand of applause, please? Thank you. I'm so confident uh, that you guys aren't going to use the drugs. I'm good. Um, but I want to tell you something. I know that you're all good people. I know it. I've been doing this now long enough to also know that good people make bad choices sometimes. It happens. I told you before, I own mine. I'm one of them. I make bad choices. Not too long ago, Recently, I don't know if I want to say I had the privilege and honor or the responsibility and duty to try a case, and I sat on the case, and I was moved. And it's, someone over here asked me how long ago the case was involving Sean and Rob. I had a case involving a young man by the name of Ryan Jeffries, and it was just the other day. I had a case involving my friend Ryan Jeffries, and it was here in Anne Arundel County. I had a case involving Ryan Jeffries, and the incident happened where you and I live. You old mill students, you feed in from the Severn area, uh, the Hanover area over that way, it happened over there. And as I'm hearing the case, I thought nothing about schools in court. I heard the case, and to close the case, I had one thing on my mind. One thing on my mind and one thing only. It wasn't if, it wasn't when, it was how long. How long, Shane, are you going to do this? And do you have the courage, the guts, and the gumption to do it? Oh, heck yes, I did. But I can't tell the story. I can't tell it right because I get emotional. 
So I asked my friend, Mr. Lerner, Ben Lerner's prosecutor who tried the case. He's the young man, Mr. Adams, signed the case, charged the case, brought the case forward. I want him to share the facts of the case and as it went forward, how we got where we are today. Ben. As Judge Spencer said, I'm Ben Lerner. I'm a prosecutor here in the county. This is Ryan Jeffries. Judge Spencer told you he had an incident that happened. December 12th, 2015 is when it happened. But I'm going to take you back before that. Ryan grew up in Anne Arundel County. Okay, he's from Anne Arundel County. He went to South River, got into college. He went to college, graduated, got a good job, moved back here. He's had a successful life, was doing well. December 12, 2015, he was at a party. He drank a little bit, and he made a simple choice. Decided to drive home. It's easy, anybody could do it. That's Quezon Donato. Ryan didn't know Quezon. Quezon has a mother who loves him. He has a fiance, he's got a son, Bryson. This photo was taken December 12, 2015. That's the last time that his son saw him. At about 1.40 in the morning, the police received this 911 call. All right, this is real. This happened here. Anne Arundel County Police responded to that. Can I get you an answer? Yeah, yeah. When they got there, that's what they found. That's Quezon Donato. The picture you saw of him holding his son 12 hours earlier, that's him now. When the police got there, the car that hit him, Ryan's car, well, it was gone. He left. The police found evidence. They tracked him down. They went to his house. They found him, found out he had been drinking, and they arrested him. Simple choice. Ryan was drinking. He got behind the wheel. He drove home, that's Quezon Donato, and now Ryan's arrested. He hired the best lawyer, one of the best lawyers in the whole state. Came to court, found guilty by Judge Spencer, and now he's looking at years, years of his life that he might have to spend in prison. Quezon's dead, 
and Ryan is now looking at years of jail time, has to face Judge Spencer. Real. I was looking at my friends over there from Old Mill because as I listened to this video, this 911, I've heard it. This is the third time I've heard it. The first time I was in trial. Just learned to play it for me again. I drive that road every day. It's Telegraph Road. I drive it twice a day to get to and from work, sometimes six times a day getting my kids to and from practices. And I want you to, in your mind, think about it. What road do you tell them to, is a crossroad? Virginia Avenue is far down by Ridgeway. There's old nannies, but there's an old, the old Severn in there now, but there's no road right there. You're in a panic. What do you tell the 911 caller? I do it every day now. I think of cases on every day. I see where his backpack was found in the woods. Who says Case should go to jail? I mean, sorry. Who says Ron Jeffers should go to jail? You're daggone right. You're daggone right. But he's not in jail. He's not in jail. Not now. Not today. Not anymore. That's on a street in your county. So you drive it every day. I can't make it more real for you. That's a case that that man right there who lives in this county tried. He's found guilty. Can't make it more real for you. Oh, but I can. Because the man who did that needs to stand up and own that. And he will. Ryan. Appreciate you coming today. This is Ryan Jeffries, ladies and gentlemen. This is the man you saw in the first clip. He wants to tell you some things. How you guys doing today? I'm here to talk to you, speak to you about uh, you know something awful that uh, that happened. Um, the biggest mistake of my life. I had made thousands, millions of all the right ones. I had graduated high school, went to college, made my parents proud, started a family, done everything right. I did one thing wrong, and it cost someone their life. And I cannot tell you enough how one decision, however inconsequential, however small, can change your life and the life of everyone else. And I think that I just want you guys to understand that just making one single choice, it doesn't matter how small it is, can literally change your life forever. It can undo everything, all the good that you've done in your life for one simple mistake, one poor decision. And you guys, I know you're not driving yet. I know you haven't had the chance to get out there and experience the world and go through awful things like this. But... I don't want you to have to do that. I want you to learn from my mistakes. I want you to see that I'm just like you. I literally came to schools in court 10 years ago. I sat right in that chair. I sat there. I sat here and listened. I sat through this whole thing. And I didn't take it all to heart, but please take it to heart for me. Please, please think about that. Before you do have this chance to drive, this privilege to drive, this privilege to go have fun, to put this privilege to go live your lives, Please don't make that same mistake and learn from this and take this opportunity to learn from everyone here that's spoken to you to understand what you can do, that, that you can change, that you cannot make these poor decisions, but in some cases you will. And I just want you guys to know that even though you will, that there's a chance for you to make it right and for you to make it better. And like Judge Spencer said, he wanted you to own it. I went in there and I owned it. And I want to introduce you today to the man who gave me my freedom. But I also want to introduce you to the woman who gave me my life back. And that's Kason's mom, who came here, who held my hand while this presentation was going on to tell me that it was okay, that she forgave me, that she had the compassion to forgive me for the loss of her son. That's not it. That's not just it. Ryan had a chance to speak before I put him in, in jail or not in jail. Out of jail, I should say. And I've been doing 
what I do for a very long time. I've heard a lot of cases. Never in my life, in my 20 some odd years of experience as being a lawyer, have I sat in a courtroom just like this, packed. Every person in the room was bawling, myself included. The bailiff, the courtroom clerk, the defense lawyer, Mr. Ryan Jeffries was crying, Mr. Ben Lerner was crying. And it wasn't because of anything I said or what Ryan said at that juncture. There's, in my opinion, two reasons Ryan's not in jail. What Ryan told me, he'll finish doing that momentarily. It was the heart, the compassion. I, I, I don't have the words for you. I bawled, I got off the bench and bawled some more. But Kaysan's mom spoke. And she begged me not to put him in jail any longer. And I, I thought about it and I got off the bench and I said, I, I thought to myself, I'm not sure I can do this. And then she got back up again. I'm going to put her on the spot. Because as part of Ryan's probation for the next five years of his life, he's going to make this right. But I had to make sure Kaysan's memory was not lost, in my opinion. And she's here. I don't know if you, this is hard for me. That's her son. I'm really going to change that clip. Do you want to speak to these kids? If that doesn't move you, I don't know what does. That's Kaysan's mom. That's someone's mom. And the man who took her son from him. able to talk to you and to show you that God is love and love exists. Every day you turn on your TV, you see something bad, you see something hateful, you hear it every day. But not often do people have the strength and the courage to stand before you and show you and display love. And that's why I'm here to show you that Ryan, made a terrible mistake and he should not have to spend the rest of his life not having support and love not just from his family but from the people that God bought in his life for that very reason which is to show you guys that love is real can you turn back to my son please for one minute? um this is the first time I saw my son after he moved out of my house. I live in New Jersey, by the way. Um, we're from New Jersey. My son uh, moved to Maryland, where my stepfather lives in Bowie, after he graduated high school. And um, he came to stay with me once, you know, he wanted to come back home. And he moved out around the second week of November. And um, I hadn't seen him since, you know. And um, his birthday was November 16th, and this was taken 17 days after his 24th birthday. 17. I want to pause right there just to rewind and tell you that I was 15 when I got pregnant with him, and I had him at 16. And the scrutiny that I had to deal with being pregnant as a teenager losing friends because their parents didn't want them around me because I made a mistake and I went against my mother and my father's rules and I did something that caused me to get pregnant at 15 and I had him at 16. I lost a lot of friends 
but I never lost my mother and father's support in the community that I grew up in. And they helped me raise him. They helped me raise this beautiful soul right here. And him and I, right before he moved out, we got into an argument and we hadn't spoken for about three weeks and it was eating me up. Because there's a part of you as a parent who don't wanna let your child grow up and you know the best decisions for your child, at least you think you know. And we had had an argument that was so bad that we didn't speak for about three weeks. And then the Wednesday before he passed away, my son had gotten bitten by a spider and he put the picture on Facebook. Well, y'all know he deleted and blocked me because he didn't want to talk to me, but he was still friends with my girlfriend. And she called me and she said, I was in school, by the way. She called me and she said, Monica, you need to call k -San. He's in the hospital. His leg is extremely swollen and it looks like it's infected. And that was on a Wednesday. I called him, he answered my phone. I didn't think he was gonna answer, but he answered my call. And we spoke for about five minutes before the doctors came in and he said, mommy, I'll call you back. And I didn't think he would, but he did. And before he can even say hello, I said, I am so sorry. He said to me, mom, you're not sorry, remember? Your mother did not raise a sorry child, but I will accept your apology. And I told all my children that, you don't say I'm sorry. You apologize and you ask for forgiveness because even too, as adults, we make bad choices. We make wrong decisions, but you can always write it right. You can make it right. That was on a Wednesday. Saturday, the last time I spoke to my son was about 11.36 in the morning. He told me him and Leanne, which was his fiance, and his son were gonna go do laundry. They were gonna go run errands. And I said, I'll come to Maryland. He said, no mom, don't worry about it. I don't need you to come. Let's shoot for next weekend. I said, you sure? Because I know you need help. You and Leanne need help with the baby. Me, mommy, we'll pack up the truck, we'll come. No mom, it's okay. His last words to me were, I love you. I'll talk to you later. What was the next phone call you received, Ms. Martin? That was Saturday. Sunday, I'm texting, no response. Monday, I'm texting, no response. Tuesday, I'm engaged in a conversation at school with two of my classmates about him. And we're laughing because he was a class clown. And my cell phone was blowing up. Can't have cell phones in school, but it was blowing up to the point where I looked at it and I noticed Leanne. And I said, it gotta be an emergency because she's calling. And when I hit the green button, she was screaming hysterically. He's gone, he's gone, he's dead, he's dead. And I said, what are you talking about? Kason, he's dead. Meanwhile, I hear the officer asking her, to give him the phone. I dropped to my knees and he said, Mr. Donato, and all I heard was, is Quezon Donato your son? And I said, yes. I can't tell you anything else after that. But I had to find out that my son died three days later over the phone. Imagine your parents having to go through that. I want to fast forward because that's she heard then. We had a trial. <laughs> you have to go ahead. Go ahead. I'm just gonna stop. Yes. Go ahead, Ryan. Go ahead. Oh. This was me. I was just like you guys. This is one of my friends' weddings. We were having a good time having a party, enjoying ourselves, like you guys all do, every Saturday, every Sunday. We were all in high school, we all did the same thing. You're gonna grow up, you're gonna go to college, you're gonna drink, you're gonna do the same thing. You're probably gonna try drugs, you're gonna make decisions that aren't the best, but we make decisions in life and we learn from them. And I hope that you guys can take from this, that you can learn from that, and that 
when you do make a poor decision, the most important thing is to just own it, to, to, to own that decision. This was me. We had a trial. After the accident, I received this. These are charges for a hit and run, drinking and driving. You can see my car. This is Kason. This is how he should be remembered. This is, the, this is the young man who gave so much happiness to the world, so much happiness to this woman right here, to his mom. His mom is here. I, I just, I don't, I, it, 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 the compassion and the, the faith that this woman has to be able to come here and support me in this, the person who took her son is, is just, it, it, it knows no bounds. And it, it just, it, it's a testament to Kason, to what she gave to him, to what she'd given to her other children, to what she's given to you today. And don't be mistaken, don't get it twisted, okay? After he was found guilty, I asked Judge Spencer, I stood up and I said, put Ryan Jeffries in jail, Judge Spencer. Look what he did. Put him in jail for years. And you know who got up and told Judge Spencer not to put him in jail? The woman with the biggest heart, the most courage, the most humility, the most strength and love in this room. And the reason that she did that, I wanted him to go to jail for what he did. She wanted him to be able to get out of jail to be in this room today to talk to you, to talk to everybody, so that you guys don't do the same thing. That's what she wants. She wants to spare your life. She wants to spare your life. She doesn't want your mom getting that phone call, your dad, your grandma, your aunt. I can't make this up. He stood up, asked for jail. He spoke, said whatever he had to say. Ms. Donato spoke once. I got off. I cried. I came back. You can't see or I can't see, but behind that curtain right there is Miss Lisa. She's my courtroom clerk. And Bobby George is probably behind there. And I, Lisa heard this. She picked up the phone, called lockup, and Bobby walked around. Because what that means to Lisa is, I'm about to put somebody in jail. Bobby knows that, stands behind them, pulls the handcuffs out, secures them. She made the phone call. The guard came out and stood behind Mr. Jeffries. I look at him in the face every, every time I see him now. I don't make any bones about it. I wanted to put you in jail for years. I was angry. My God, I was angry. I was hurt. Scream, I'm a dad just like you, man. And I was dying inside. Dying inside. And there's one thing, one thing stopped that from happening. Saved Ryan Jefferson from spending a very, 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 very long time in jail. Monica Donato said, Judge, you can't do that. She actually walked over and did what she did here earlier. I, I was humbled. She hugged him and said, You gotta save his life. Case Island can't die for nothing. Someone's gotta do something. I said, okay. I got down, I, I, I brought the lawyers back. We wiped our tears. We got a plan. This is my plan. If that don't move you, nothing will. Skip the dead body up there, because she saw it. She cries when she sees it. Come almost full circle, not yet, but what I want to tell you is something that said earlier. Judge Morrissey said it to you, Dr. Arlotta said it to you. This is real life. I don't know any of you. I like you, but I don't love you yet. Give me a chance, I might love you. But there's love in this room. The love that this woman carries in her heart. Not just for her son, for all of you. <coughs> Ryan said it, you're gonna make some choices. I don't want you to smoke weed, you might. I don't want you to drink, you might. I don't want you to drink and drive. You might. Own it and make it right. Because I can't promise you, I can't promise you the young man, almost young, you kill, will have a mom like this superhero. I've never seen anything like it before. I don't think Judge Spencer has either. Not in all my life. 
I think about it on a daily basis. I told you I drive that road every day. When I think about having to see Mr. Nato, I get teared up. But then I see her and Ryan interact. And I heard the word, she says, I have the notes that I scribbled down on my trial pad in my chambers. You don't know this, I keep it on my desk. I don't have a picture of Kason on my desk. I don't have anything from Kason. I have Mr. Nato's words. Because that is what Sid Baird, Ryan Jeffries from going to jail, but that also allows me the privilege of giving her the benefit to speak to you. Good dude. Good dude. Seahawk, uh, South River. Went to college. Got his master's. Got a job. Did fabulous things. Record was crystal clean. Good dude made bad choice. Anybody still want him to go to jail? Go ahead, be brave. Tell him, he's right here, he don't care. Yeah, look, 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 prosecutors do. He ain't mad at you. He's not in jail, anybody okay with that? I'm okay with it. I've come to grips with it. Because Mr. Nall asked me to do so. Not for her. Not for her ego, not to lessen her blow. In my opinion, to save your lives. To save your lives. Maybe one of you, job well done, Mr. Nato. Maybe five of you, you're a superhero, Mr. Nato. Maybe 10 of you, you are among the gods in my eyes, Mr. Nato. I'll be honest, he's a dad. Mr. Crane, you're a dad. Mr. Adams, you're a dad. Dr. Oh, you're a dad. I challenge you, I don't have the courage to do that. I don't. So I'm gonna give you my mean mug, my duck face, and say, judge, put that man in jail and throw away the key. <laughs> I stand here next to this woman, and those words never came across her lips. The thought, at least in my mind, on that day never crossed her mind. Her mission, it didn't involve you at that point. Her mission was to make sure that Kaysan, his passing didn't go for naught. And then when we thought this through, how can we do this? How can we make this worthy? First thing I did was call Dr. Arlotto. Can I have lunch? That man said, I'll meet you at the normal spot. I won't tell you where it is. <laughs> we met the normal spot. And we had lunch. And after I met with Mr. Jeffries and Mr. Lerner, and I got Mr. Nato's approval, this is the result. I'll be honest, this is the second time we've done this with Kaysan and Ryan. First time was, I'm gonna give us about an 85% on our, our score, a grade. I'm gonna tell you why. Because I didn't have the secret ingredient to bring it all home, make it real. I didn't have this. A mom. Man, I'm a dad and I think I'm a great dad. I think I'm a rock star. But I know at the end of the day that I am just a dad and moms rule the world. I'm a son and I love my mommy best, bro. I love my mom to death. So have someone's mom standing here is okay. Having Kason's mom here, I think it brings it all home. We talked and here we are. Let's show another slide of Kason. There's one more slide I want you to see. Look at that beautiful woman and that beautiful man. Well, that was right before, that was at the church, right? Mm -hmm. Look at that young man. One more. That is his son. That's his son holding his picture. Now I got teenagers. You don't. You got young ones. You remember that? Dr. Law, you remember when your kids were young and that one? You imagine them holding your picture and not having your dad there, man. Better yet, your teenagers. You imagine not having your mom or dad there. Graduation picture. Team picture. Time championship. Not there. Imagine that. 
Well, mom and dad will be there, but you won't be there because you're drunk or high. One more. I'm not coming to your funeral. I'm not. I won't keep it together because I failed you. Ryan made a point, and he said it last time. I, I, I'm diligent and copious. And I hope you guys take one. I take notes the whole time I'm here. I want to know what I'm doing, what I'm going to say next. Ryan came to school as a court, sat on that side 10 years ago. I'll tell you something. My colleagues did this before, did a great job. My colleagues before me didn't have what I have. I have a fabulous team. I have a great friend in Dr. Allah to help me do this. This program has come light years from where it used to be. Ten years ago, they didn't have Monica Donato. Ten years ago, they didn't have some judge going to put Ryan Jeffries in jail. Ten years ago, they didn't have Mrs. George here to tell you about what happened in, in the hospital. They didn't have that. I got it. In ten years, I hope Dr. Lotto is still there and I'm gone. I'm not going to be doing this then. But I hope someone says, that program then, that was the bomb diggity, and that dude rocked it well in his pink shirt, tie, I'm sorry, and my socks, Mr. Adams. See, I'm, I got it all, but I have Mr. Nada. If that doesn't change something in your lives, nothing will. Nothing. Part of this issue is, well, the, the premise, it's Ryan's here. Ask the question if you want to. Be brave, ask him. The superhuman's here. If you want to ask her why she's here, ask her. Mr. Lerner's here. He talks to me now. For a period of time, he wasn't even communicating. He wouldn't even look at me. He got over it. You have a question, young man? Yes, sir. How did you learn to forgive? Come here. Please. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you mind if I give you a hug? Justin. I called Justin up here because he's fond of you. <laughs> and he was distracted, and I wanted him to pay attention. I'll put you on blast, I'm sorry. <laughs> he was a little distracted, but I wanted him to come up here because me too, like all of us, can be distracted. And distractions can cause issues that cause us to make mistakes because we're not listening. We're not actively listening, and I want him to actively listen to me. And I want, him, I want to be able to hear him clearly because I want him to hear my response clearly. But I also want to let you know that I'm here to pay attention to you. So ask your questions. Again. How did you learn to forgive? How did I learn to forgive? Um, I believe in God. I, I believe in God, and God controls everything inside of me. And Behavior is learned, but I can't explain it from a spiritual sense, at least maybe not right now, how I was able to forgive Ryan. But I never, and hate is a strong word, I never hated him. I was angry because of what happened to my son, but I never hated him. I wanted to meet him, I wanted to see him, I wanted to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with him, and we will. But I need to be a part of his life to continue the love that I feel in here. I needed to execute into him, on him, around him, so we can pass it to you. So I don't know if I directly answered your question, how did I forgive? I, I just know how to love, and I know how to love hard. I know how to love passionately. It's innocent. It's real. And I'm just going to continue to do that and keep God first. The distinction is that that's a mother's love. You like her, she likes you, I'm telling you both now, you don't love her and she don't love you. You know why? I won't let it happen yet. You're not old enough to love him yet. <laughs> when you're like 25, you still dig him, then you can love him. She might like you, you might love her, you can't love her yet. You ain't big, you ain't grown. At 25, she still likes you, come see me, I'll marry you myself. That love, the love you need. A mom's love, bro. Okay. In all seriousness, it is that love 
that humility, that passion that didn't send Ron Jeffries to jail. I'm going to say it again. In a criminal matter, the defendant always has the last word. Always has the last word. And Ryan spoke. And the, the tap happened. I tapped on my desk. It was over. And Mr. Nala stood up and came back. And she asked me what she asked my young man, Justin, right here. Judge, can I give him a hug? And I want to tell him, I'm sorry, he's going through this. I want to tell Ryan's family, I'm sorry, they're going through this. Because Ryan's family's there, and his friends are there, his colleagues and, and neighbors are there. And she asked me to give that man a hug and tell him he's sorry. She's sorry to him. I knew at that juncture, uh, nothing I could do. Then she asked me not to do what I was going to do. And I honored her request. Some of you may say you're crazy. Some of you may say you're stupid. Some of you may say you're soft and you're light. I say I have a chance and an opportunity. I've been blessed with the privilege of having the benefit of Mr. Nada and Mr. Jeffries in my life. That makes a difference. Ten years ago, someone talking to Ryan back there didn't make a difference. I'm hoping ten years later, someone who was you, someone who was you, someone you all have or had, makes a difference. That's my hope. That's my hope. Ryan's going to do this again, because I'm going to ask him to. Ryan's going to do something else, because I'll ask him to. But I want you to know, part of what spared Ryan was Ryan did a lot and didn't, I didn't ask him to. And he was humble and owned his mistake and turned in a courtroom like this and apologized to Ms. Donato before he knew what I was going to not going to do. I understand that someone's life is taken, not lost on me. But the person who that affects most has asked to make a difference in your lives. And I'm begging you, don't make that three plus hour drive from New Jersey this morning to get up at two o'clock in the morning to be here to talk to you, that's her, go for naught. I'm not paying her to be here. I didn't buy her gas. I might buy her lunch. <laughs> but she's here because she wants to make a difference in your lives. Help me make her the rock star that she is. You have a question? You just want to say hi. No, no question. Yes, ma'am. How can you forgive someone that you can't see, you can't touch, you can't hear? You said, how do I forgive? Like, how, like, as advice, like, how can you forgive someone that you can't see, touch, or hear, someone that's not here? I have faith in God. Faith in prayer. Ladies and gentlemen, this is my second time, my second benefit and privilege of working with Ryan and Mr. Nada. I gave us an 85 the first time. I'm going to give us a 98. I want to earn the 100% on this test, on this presentation. And the way I, I earn my 100 is that this team does their job. And we do our job collectively as one team is if when we leave here and we go do our thing and you do your thing, you make some better choices. Quezon Donato, Telegraph Road, Ryan Jeffries. I'll say it one more time. Quezon Donato. It's with a K. I want to be in the back of your heads. And then you heard what his mother said. Ms. Monica Donata said she's here because she has love to give you. Don't make it for naught. We're going to change gears. We're going to turn the cameras off. I'm asking the lawyers to get their cases together. We're going to present you a few cases real quick. Before we do that, I would like to give Ms. Donato and Mr. Ron Jeffries a round of applause for their humble <laughs> Thank you so much. I don't have you doing that, right? 
I appreciate it.